Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to bring you a premiere, the Castle Cup, a tournament I've co-organized together with Wisdom, an American organization I've worked together with to produce Hots content, now for Age of Empires 4. We've set together an invitational tournament with eight players divvied up in teams of two, and we've got three amazing YouTube videos to bring to you. This is video number one. It is a one-on-one -on -one and two-on-two -on -two show match with four different teams the clan war you're going to be watching now is actually Jim Rising and Neely, an ex-Starcraft and AoE 2 player together against the streaming collective, the Germans, from Banjwa, Red Panda and Honor. They had an exhilarating clan war and there's going to be three matches in this clan war, two one-on-ones and there's going to be a two-on-two -two match as well. Enjoy the show coming up. I've casted this together with my friend Moltrap way back from StarCraft 2 days. It's been so much fun. The unique point of this cup is also that every civilization is represented. All eight players are picking eight different civilizations, decided via snake draft. It's a well-produced show, and you're going to be about to watch the first match right here. Match two and three of the second semi-finals and the finals are going to be coming at you in future uploads very, very soon. Enjoy and thanks for watching. Game number one of the Castle Cup about to begin, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I am stoked. I hope you are too. Let's get this started. All right, guys, things have started. It's Mountain Pass and well, Moltrap, in Age of Empires 4, and this may be confusing to some Bliss RTS veterans, maps are procedurally semi-randomly generated. So you're not just scouting where your opponent is, you're also for natural resources, you're scouting for the layout of the map, the major choke points of the map, and more. Yeah, and uh, you, you do, you, when you spawn into the game, you don't even know where your opponent is necessarily. There's some generalities that you can know, okay, if I'm here, they're probably going to be over there. But you got to figure it all out ahead of time. And, you know, like we said, there's generally one pass between the mountains on this map. But in this case, we've got two gaps in that <laughs> yeah. big mountain range. So this is actually going to be a very, uh, well, perhaps substantially differently played game than other games on this map. Because you're not going to have one point that you need to make sure your opponent can't get through. But there's two that you need to go through. Um, the resources are generally evenly distributed, but sometimes there's going to be stuff in the middle. Near that choke point, there's often a big gold patch right in the middle of one of those gaps where you kind of have to fight over that as you're trying to fight for control of the breach in the mountains as well. So um, we're going to see how this plays out, though. We do see that uh, Red Panda has gone for an early mosque. Very, very standard play for our Delhi uh, civilization. And um, yeah. We're getting into this game. It's going to be a little bit before these guys pick up and really reveal their eventual strategies. But right now, they're getting underway, exploring the map with their scouting units, which are actually literally called scouts, collecting sheep so they have food to harvest in the early game and getting things ramping up. Yeah, exactly. Like these are the opening parts of the build. And we see a standard opener here for Jim Rising going with about eight on food, two on gold to get to the feudal age quickly. And his scouting has mostly been limited towards, as you can see, his own side of the map. He's been collecting sheep. He's been checking what are the resources around himself. And, you know, what we can see on the big world map is that the relics, which is just one of many neutral areas and resources to fight over, have spawned relatively favorably for Jim Rising, with four mm. on, quote unquote, his side of the mountain pass and just oh, wow. one on the side of Red Panda. Now, neither of these factions are Rus, who can pick up relics the fastest. They're not Holy Roman, who need them the most. So there are a point of resource that matter. As we can see, four of them on the blue side of the map. And just to wow. touch back on the openings of the mountain pass as well, there's one big opening, one small. The small opening also has a little backdoor alley. There's actually multiple wall segments that would need to be made if one of them mm. wants to use wall to buffer and keep out the opponent's aggression. Very interesting. Uh, we probably will still see that, I imagine. We'll probably still see them kind of face off on opposite sides of the wall, but who knows? Because, you know, Abbasid Dynasty is uh, considered to be a civilization that functions really well when they get their economic wing first and get the foodstuffs upgrade to get villagers out en masse very quickly with a second town center, go for the economic play. Uh, Delhi 
can go for sacred sites early, although it's very difficult to do on this map because one of the sacred sites is deep in enemy territory behind that pass. But even though you would think it would be a late game strategy, it's not guaranteed at all in this game. It's one of the really cool aspects of this is that you, you never know exactly what your opponent is going to do and what to expect. And you always have to be looking and adapting based on what you can see. Exactly. And, you know, sacred sites, they're a way to generate gold over time. If you occupy them, they're kind of like a zone control. You get gold per minute, 100 for most sifts, 200 for Delhi with the Sanctity upgrade. They're also a win condition, but you need to hold both sides for 10 minutes. On this map, that's virtually undoable because of the location. So most likely we'll see the el elimination tactic where they try to subjugate each other by destroying each other's armies or going to take down each other's buildings. Now this scout blunders into the enemy base. You quickly have Jim Rising filling up villagers into the town center. If you do that quickly, sometimes you can snipe the misstepping scout. But luckily for Red Panda, he does not end up losing his scout. And he even picks up a few nifty, quote unquote, enemy sheep that he can later bring back to his base and gather food from. Yeah, that was a little bit close. Um, and very, very uh, well done by Jim Rising to spot that that option and see, okay, he's wandering within range. I'm gonna jump several of my villagers in here so they can take some pot shots before going back to work. Um, we do have a barracks going up here for Red Panda, by the way. And um, kind of like it's, it's interesting to see that he is going for early barracks. Does this mean he's going for aggression, do you think? Or is this just he wants to be a little bit safe because he doesn't know exactly what Jim Rising is gonna be up to? So it's interesting, right? Like his, his scout just passed by the left side, the west side of uh, Jim Rising space, and he saw five villagers on stone. This leaves mm. almost no doubt about what's possibly happening. And just for the purpose yeah. of open-mindedness, it can be two things. Stone walls, aggressive stone wall chiefs with towers, or the far more likely option, and the correct option, is to go for a fast expansion, a second town center. We'll explain more about why you would want a second town center and why especially Abbasid might want to do that. But Red, the point is Red Panda has seen it. So his yeah. barracks, it cannot possibly mean Spearman aggression as Spearman do not fight well under enemy town center defenses. So why is he doing it? He doesn't need it for defense. Is he gonna build Palisade walls with the early spears or is it just part of his build and he's stalwartly sticking to it despite the seeming absence of a need to defend with them? Yeah, um, yeah, it's kind of, we'll have to see what he does with this. It, it could be potentially for some kind of, I don't know, could he be, do a tower rush, like a Mongol-style tower rush or put Spearman in a tower? Because even though he's going to get a second, second town center rather pretty quickly, and the town center is a defensive building as well, his base is a little bit spread mm. out. The resources are a little bit far away from his first town center and where his second one could be. So there might be some gaps there where he could put some aggression down and disrupt the gold mining perhaps, or... Uh, get in amongst uh, the... Well, I guess he's not going to be mining stone anymore, so that's not really a point of contention either. And yeah. actually, yeah, so now we see the location of that second town center is exactly what I was saying, over by the gold, where it was a little bit of a vulnerability. So, um, yeah, there's not actually... I don't see any gaps right now in Jim Rising's defense, actually, so I'm not sure he's going to be able to put, anything, put any pressure on him. So, Mole Trap, if Light Aggression cannot find any gaps and pick off some units, which I think you've established well, what is the fallback point? And as we look at this, as our wow. observer is showing, Siege Engineering has been started for Red Panda. Now, the recent patch that mm. reworked Delhi uh, actually changed early upgrades to be quicker and late upgrades to be slower. Much of the attention of the demise of Delhi has been focused on the length of time that Imperial upgrades take. But the early upgrades are faster. Now, when, when we speak yeah. of Delhi, we still think very much of a Delhi that likes to be a slow roller, the turtle that overtakes the hare eventually, right? Defense, we're thinking of sacred side cheese. That's not what Red Panda is doing here. He's gone for a siege engineering upgrade. It takes only two minutes, 28 seconds to finish. It is free. So it saves resources that other factions yeah. might have uh, had to make with that. Delhi doesn't rush. Abbasid expands. Abbasid always goes second TC because the fresh food stuffs makes villagers so cheap. But Delhi doesn't rush. Very likely, Jim Rising feels a kind of sense of safety. Yeah. Red Panda is taking the rams to him. He's going to make archers and he's going to attack. He's going to try to kill the second town center. Wow. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on here, I think. Uh, very good call. And I don't know if Jim Rising... Yeah, Jim Rising's scout is just chilling in the pass between the mountains just kind of waiting to see what happens. So he does not have as much information about this 
as he would like. Now on the mini map, you can see that there's no vision of the buildings. That's actually just a bug where we're not seeing in observer mode what right. he previously saw. But Jim Rising does have information about some of the buildings there. We don't know exactly what he ha does though. I don't think he knows about the two archery ranges. I mean, obviously he does now because he sees the archers. <laughs> previously, I don't think he'd scouted those archery ranges. So now he's like a little bit worried about this aggression. And I don't know if he knows about the blacksmith either. So he may not be expecting the ram follow-up that's going to go with these archers. So let's talk about the viability of strategies. Uh... Is it sensible for a Delhi player to take five to ten archers, apply aggression like an English player would with their free council hall, uh, and, then, and then just fall back and, and macro? Maybe it's possible. But now the ram, I think, is actually being made in vision of yeah. the Abbasid Dynasty player, Jim Rising. So that pretty much sells it. Like, I don't think he's going to cancel it, fake out, and force his opponent to make too many workers. Like too much defense. It doesn't work like StarCraft where you've got to choose drones or Zerklings to defend. Like, no, if there's a round making there, it's going to finish and he's going all in. Yeah. And uh, by the way, Red Panda is at the feudal age. He what? has actually put three. He canceled it. He, can he canceled the ram? Yeah. Just what wow. I said. That he's not going to fake make a ram. <laughs> he bloody well goes and cancels it. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, this is the thing is he, th there's uh, so many mind games and this, this is what comes, comes when you have <laughs> players that are just so experienced in RTSs, the mind games come out and we're seeing them right here where, uh, you know, Red Panda is saying, all right, well, he's playing Abbasid on a turtle map. I know yeah. he's going to turtle. I'm going to rush him, even though he's not expecting it. And then I'm going to actually cancel that and play a little bit defensively. Now, Jim Rising does have some units. He does have his own archer range. He's producing horsemen as well. So this is actually a pretty good counter uh, composition to what Red Banda has, although he can, of course, of course, kite back to his own defenses. So Horseman, they do bonus damage to archers. They're fast, uh, but they don't have any armor. They don't have pierce armor, so they still take full damage from archers. That means if there's enough horsemen, they can kill all the archers on the field. But just a few are kiteable. They are killable. You actually notice Red Panda targeting the Ooh. archers first, which have more of a threat. Oh, he's actually killing some deers. Absolute BM move by Red Panda. Oh. Proverbial glove to the face. <laughs> wow, and he's got spearmen coming as well, actually. Perfect to deal with these horsemen. And that was that barracks that we saw earlier is now putting into play. He's, he's anticipating the counter to his archers of horsemen, getting the spearmen as well. We do have some horsemen charging down at these archers. There's only one spearman to defend them. And some of the um, horsemen are low on hit points there. This one spearman could solo all three horsemen left if they're low enough. And he's kiting back with the archers as well. They do do some damage to the horsemen, even though they have a bit of armor. And it looks like Jim Rising pushing farther and farther into his base. As soon as he loses the horsemen though, falling back and retreating, and it looks like he's trying to build a wall in between. He's kind of putting this pressure on, saying, all right, I'm going to force you to deal with my forces, but it looks like he wants to try and lock Red Panda out because he's feeling like Red Panda does have a superior force at the moment, which is completely true. As you can see, several archers bearing down on these few injured ones retreating back to base. Now, this scholar now starts to take the sacred side, Mole Trap, but this scholar was sent here more than two minutes ago. He stepped on for a second, stepped off, and in the chaos of the ensuing battle, he never did his holy duty to stand on the side. Hundreds mm. of points of gold were already sold, uh, were already uh, lost by Red Panda. And the wall that he actually tried to put up to, to defend himself, to, get, keep, uh, to take and keep the side, didn't get made because Jim Rising was pushing in so aggressively, and now he cancelled it. And Red Panda steps forward. There's still that sense that Red Panda is playing off of a single town center initially, but actually, as we look at the minimap, I think Red Panda, he pulled the fast one. We saw the ram, oh, we wow. saw the, the sacred side, and then the ram wood that he cancelled, the 300 wood he gets back, <laughs> is back in the bank. What do you do with a surplus of wood? You gather stone in the meantime and make an expansion. And that's exactly what he did. He's got his own second town center and the bonus gold from the sacred side. Wow. And three scholars pumping out upgrades. You can see he's already upgraded the ability for his scholars to chill inside. With, uh, I say chill, the technical term being garrisoned yeah, inside studying. of his production buildings, which is going to increase production drastically. So even though he only has a couple units, uh, I'm sorry, a couple unit production facilities. He can pump them out very, very quickly with those scholars as well. Off of two town centers, which means he's going to have a lot of income in addition to that. So, um, yeah, really, really masterful the strategy here by Red Panel. I am super impressed by this uh, very unique Delhi strategy play. 
Yeah, you know what's awesome? In the last two months, we've seen a burgeoning of esports from different organizations. It's been so much fun to watch. <laughs> and while this is our debut, uh, I've never seen a, a match yet where someone prepared to make a fake ram to force an opponent to make <laughs> Worse Man, the nickname I have for Horse Man, since <laughs> they, they, they tend to sometimes underwhelm a bit. He's essentially forced Jim Rising to spend loads of food on Horseman. And then he falls back and he tries to win with superior castle tech. Now both players have started their castle age tech. They are on their they're gonna they're on their way to the third age. Who's gonna mm. be able to make better use of it? And will Red Panda survive this horseman attack? Yeah, horseman coming in on top of those archers. He needs to retreat. He has spearmen kind of falling back. They're gonna take the gap in between the buildings. A nice. perfect location. However, Jim Rising has a couple more archers. He's gonna be able to bear down on top of those spearmen very very quickly and demolish them. Now he is within. Red Panda's zone of defense. He's next to his town center, so Red Panda is probably not in danger of losing right off here because there's no rams that are going to start killing his buildings. Only a few horsemen that can do torch damage to the buildings. But it's not... You don't necessarily win with a push like this by killing their buildings. You win by killing their villagers as they defend the buildings and killing their units as they defend the buildings and gaining a longer-term advantage. He's up to now several horsemen here. So I feel like Jim Rising has basically taken some map control and interestingly, he's got a camel out as well. I can't tell if that's, I think it's a camel archer. Yeah. Um, just in case of uh, his opponent going for some cavalry to counter his. So let's take a look at Jim Rising's base and maybe compare villager count as well. That's going to be a big key here. Jim Rising himself just reached Castle Age. So at this point, mm. as the game kind of slows down and both players aren't killing each other directly, I'm super curious to see. We've got 54 villagers for Red Panda, uh, military 26. And then we look at Jim Rising, he's got 59 villagers. So the faction, the Sif, that uh, tends to excel at making a second town center has been overtaken, basically. Well, almost overtaken, has been equalized by the Delhi player. Delhi, uh, Red Panda also had a sacred site for about three minutes. That's given him 600 mm. bonus gold. Every minute Delhi has a sacred site counts as five villagers. So essentially, yeah. Red Panda has garnered more resources up until this point than his adversary, uh, Jim Rising. And now we're starting to see Ooh. a little bit of a resource fight over the relics, Moltrap. Yeah, and he's taking, crucially, if this does fall back into a macro battle, he's taken one of the relics out of that gap from quote-unquote Jim Rising's side of the map. Although it looks like... He might get killed by the army or at least the wolf, but at least he can at least he can get this relic back towards his base farther before this uh, unit actually dies. Wait, it actually wait, is, is he gonna do a mass conversion? Oh no, he's going for the conversion. Is he gonna kill? <laughs> oh, 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 he kills the scholar fast enough, and uh, that was almost. A, but it, the thing is, is that distracts all of that arrow fire for a moment, an entire volley away from his attacking units, so his men-at-arms and archers were able to close in there, and it looks like Jim Rising is going to be forced to fall back a bit as a result. So we just see the glow coming over the archers of Jim Rising. was wondering which wing he had gone to Castle H with. We now know it's mm. the military wing, and he just finished the upgrade for camels that give plus one armor to all infantry units. This counts archers, crossbows, spears, and men-at-arms. That's one extra armor. The same nice. thing you can get from a blacksmith armor upgrade. But the way armor works, every extra point of armor is more effective than a previous point. So if he's stacking those upgrades with actual blacksmith upgrades, that's going to make his archers super hard to kill. This is a very favorable fight for Jim Rising, despite all the mind games perpetrated against him. He's doing admirably, sending horsemen around, trying to distract, trying to maybe kill villagers. His uh, archer camels, actually his camel riders have been taken down. Great job at Red Panda focusing those. Yeah, they got out a little bit ahead of the other archers since they are faster riding camels, but they were able to be targeted down as a result. So a lot of harassment going on here. There's these horsemen coming in, trying to kill some of the food villagers as well. And as you can see, he has popped in some villagers into that uh, town center. Town centers are used for making villagers, but they're also very effective defensive structures in the early and mid game. So it's not gonna kill him, but you know, if you dive underneath that town center and you kill several villagers, it's actually gonna be worthwhile, even if you lose your horsemen, if you're killing a lot of villagers as well, because then they don't have the economy to rebuild the units that you've lost as equally. Yeah, exactly, that's a good point because every moment a villager is alive, they're garnering about an average of 40 resources per minute. So the earlier you kill any enemy villagers, even if it costs you units, as long as you can buy enough time to not die some, to some kind of counterattack, that's always going to be a good trade. Kind of the linchpin, one of the rules of thumb 
of mm -hmm. an RTS game with a heavy economy emphasis like Age of Empires 4 has. I'm so excited that we're seeing a mountain pass game where there's not just walls in the middle. We're actually seeing a <laughs> lot of skirmishing here and a lot of building up of military. Basically, no one having the breathing room to actually build a wall. And just as I How'd see that, that, we do see <laughs> that Red Panda has got enough stone in the bank to produce some stone walls there in the middle. Of course, there is two gaps. So he may just be defending that one gap to make sure that he can't get bypassed and right. get attacked from behind so that he can defend this one spot with his military. Here we go some more. While he's off building that wall and protecting his villagers building the wall, um, we actually do see a little bit of a counterattack. And I say villagers actually... Delhi can make walls with their infantry, so that was probably what was going on there. So he didn't um, but get some brass on the infantry as well. He didn't go for the compound of the defender uh, landmark, which has been seeing more popularity recently, and therefore he had mm. to use villagers for the stone walls. They ah, can okay. only build wooden walls right now, but he went with the house of slow learning, where you can get honed blades upgrades in 22 minutes. A uh, bit of a meme by now, but we'll see, we'll see how he progresses with that in a bit. Right now, we've got a big fight going on. The Camel Riders have bonus damage to Spearmen, not so into Men at Arms. They still do good damage, but in come some Knights from the flank as well. The crossbows are being taken out by the Knights that have closed the gap. Jim Rising bringing out numerous different units. Nice army composition, but a Meganel oh, shot! Oh, the Meganel coming out at just the right moment, raining down stones on top of those infantry. And, and as soon as he sees that, Jim Rising forced to fall back. All he has is infantry clumped up together. Manganel's doing AoE damage. Sorry, area of effect damage, I should say, not <laughs> Age of Empires damage. <laughs> and uh, he's going to get pushed back now, even though he was incurring, uh, incurring into the enemy base and doing significant damage. He's retaken that sacred site that you mentioned that he lost earlier. So um, Red Pen is going to be able to get back that gold income per minute um, pretty steadily. And it looks like he's kind of stabilized. Using that Castle Age tech to get the Manganel out, you know, there's kind of... Uh, rock, paper, scissors in this game between horsemen, archers, and spearmen, but there's also kind of a vertical rock, paper, scissors where if you get higher tech units, it can, um, you know, really do well against the lower tech units, although sometimes the lowest tech units are used to kill the high tech units in exchange. So how is he going to respond to this siege tech that we're seeing coming out from, from Red Panda? Exactly. That's a, that's a great question, Moltrap. And, you know, we actually see a little bit of a food bank by Abbasid as well here by, by Jim Rising question was is he going to try to go oh that's a lot of villagers the question is is go. he going to try to go imperial because bombards uh, sprinkles with range are all excellent answers to that which you just described the mangonel threat you can also close the gap with men at arms and a bit of a good split but this attack force is now being encountered with a last minute stone wall think of a the deluge, a flood, a river expanding its banks. He was ready to flow over the land, and just in time, the sandbags were thrown up by Red Panda, and there will be no flood today. He will get extra time to control his site. Little bit of a caveat, he's built two stone walls in the main entrances, and he tried to make a little wall in the little, remember the back door, remember how, uh, mm. what, what's the keep called in Lord of the Rings? Uh, Helm's Deep, remember how Helm's Deep fell <laughs> <laughs> from behind? That's still open, and if Wormtongue does this, does the betrayal, then Jim uh, Rising can actually manage to circumvent that. He's actually in that area right now in the center of the map. Interesting. I played a game on this map uh, a week or two ago where I scouted everything, or so I thought, mm -hmm. and it turned out there was a tiny, tiny gap at the very far corner of the mountain pass, and just when I was marching into the enemy base uh, with some siege and killing him off, there was suddenly... 30 men at arms in my farms, and I was I didn't know how they got there. So you always have to watch out on this map for those extra little passes and stuff. We're seeing the top here. There isn't such a pass there in the top, but there are in the middle uh, some spots that you can kind of go through. So yeah, maybe he actually built this wall that that kind of like aims towards the gap, and he actually managed to close it up. I, I do believe he had he another. Might have. He had another stone wall segment planned, it's gone. So I'm actually assuming it is a full wall off. So the game slows down. Jim Rising is actually ready for that because he's got all the food required to go to the Imperial Age. Yeah, and what is this? It's hard to tell which color that is. Is Red. that- uh... Red and dead. Okay, so... <laughs> so, okay, so trying to sneak one of those relics out of his opponent's side of the map. Actually two, looks like he's trying to sneak two relics out of his opponent's side of the map. And actually, if he wants to, he can go through his gate, drop off one relic, run back through, grab the other one, and pull it back again. Oh, yeah, And yeah. then we'll go from, instead of Jim Rising have four relics on side of his map, it's going to be Red Panda with control of four relics instead. Yeah, that's, that's pretty insane. And, you know, at the end of the day, this game is a 
infinite skill ceiling kind of management game. There's so much multitask that anyone could be doing better. You can keep inching lumber camps closer to the wood in order to reduce mining time and gathering time and traveling time for your villagers. He could be moving this scholar right now and bring it back quicker. And Jim Rising might have spared 200 wood for a mosque of his own and to make an imam and to pick up some yeah. relics. Something that didn't seem important during the aggressive stages in the game where they were trading blows, but that eventually may come back to haunt him. He didn't have that management. It looked for a while mm. like he was the upper dog, but now Red Panda is looking at, like you said, four relics out of five, that's 400 gold per minute when he manages to stash them all. He has a sacred site and Jim Rising does not yet. That's 600 gold per minute for free compared to what Jim Rising has, so he will be able to afford more bombers. But that's not the only story. There's also active mining of gold from the mining, uh, the gold mining nodes. Jim Rising has um, uh, access, of course, to start getting some gold from these. But overall, Red Panda seems to have settled himself into a very snug position. Yeah, and even just the fact that he was kind of scouting around his side of the map, uh, looking for stragglers with his army, he, he being Jim Rising in this case, he missed the opportunity to gun down that scholar as it was carrying two relics out of his side of the map as well. So sometimes those small little decisions can have a big impact in the long game. We do see that Jim Rising is kind of expanding out into his side of the map and taking control of some of those extra resources farther away from his main town center. But I feel like Red Panda, like he's getting all these resources. It looks like he might be looking to push. He's got a lot of siege units. He's got that gate just because he's it's his wall. Just because he's yeah. on that side of the wall doesn't mean he's stuck there. He can go through the gate and attack if he wants to. And I think his army is better than Jim Rising's, especially because we did see Jim Rising just advance to the Imperial Age, which means he's invested a lot of resources into that. And um, looking at the armies right now, by the way, Jim Rising, 175 supply, Red Panda at 200, marching into oh. Jim Rising's side of the map. Jim Rising does not have a scout near that wall. He does not see this coming until ah! it finally emerges into his vision. His one Mangadel is going to get a nice pot shot onto a lot of that infantry, but there's so much siege units in the background for Red Panda. He's going to do a lot of damage unless, unless Jim Rising can get on top of him and kill them off. There's a huge battle going on in the middle of the map. Uh, sorry, middle of Jim Rising side of the map, I should say. A lot of infantry. He's got plenty of swordsmen and uh, pikemen in order to deal with these horsemen, but they've broken through that line. He's getting on top of the archers and the siege units. If he can kill off the archers and siege units in the back, he will be able to be victorious. Both players now in the Imperial Age, but no Imperial units in this battle right now. It looks like it's just a free-for-all Duke Fest and some of... Oh, wow. Nicely done. He sent some of his men-at-arms off to the side to harass villagers in the middle of the battle. A very good strategy. It looks like Jim Rising just has less troops on the ground, though. And eventually, these archers trading blows, when you've got more archers and mangonels, you're going to be able to succeed in the long run. And it looks like he is going to finally push Jim Rising into a retreat back to his base. Does he have anything back in his base to defend this push, though? Uh, it, it, it's the question. He reached Imperial quicker, 17 villagers, power built, the landmark for uh, Red Panda himself. Men at arms now are starting to kill some villagers. We're counting four or five corpses, maybe. Camel archers are coming in to kind of try to deal with those and they can kite, uh, which means shooting and moving away in order to kind of win the trade. But this has been a fantastic fight for the Delhi player. He'll, he can now theoretically be working on Madrasa at home, the equivalent for Delhi of universities, get some of the long late game advantage upgrades. And while they do take a long time for Delhi, they're free. And he has stone walls to buffer. He did a surprise attack with Springles and Mangonels. Great micro by him, taking down all the Mangonels of Jim Rising with expert Springle shots as he came in and his Mangonels wreaked havoc upon Jim Rising. We're now in a crisis management mode for Jim Rising. There's Mangonels, there's Rams. Oh, he's he's going to try to kill. To... Oh, he's got the Gamma Arches and Springles. Can he take down the Mangonels though? Yeah. Oh yeah. And then this is what he needs to be doing here. He needs to have some sort of anti-siege defense. And when I said he's going for the kill, I was referring to uh, Red Panda. Getting those Rams is saying, I'm not just going to be content with you know, winning this with this battle. I'm going to go in and try and kill off some of your infrastructure as well. That's what the Rams are for. But seeing those spring alt, he's like, okay, well, nah, I may not be able to actually get these Rams close enough to do any damage. So he's actually falling back. He's sending the Rams around the side. <laughs> Sneaky I mean, Rams. Oh, I mean, he was trying to hide them, I guess. But Jim Rising has spotted it. And unfortunately, they have been separated from his army. So he's going to be able to kill off those Rams. 600 uh, lumber is going to be going down. Um, and maybe that's uh, enough of a comeback for Jim Rising to maybe not... 
get an advantage, but try and stabilize here and try and get some of those Imperial units out so he can maybe have an advantage in going into the late game. Right, it, it's a reprieve, right? As these rams are trying to get away, like two old <laughs> brontosauruses, kind of hard to miss them, <laughs> thundering by slowly uh, going their way. They're going to get hunted down. But like you said, it buys time. And if I'm not mistaken, the Kama archers are now elite. Uh, Jim Rising also has a really nice trade route set up. And if we can take a look at his House of Wisdom, we can check which civilization-specific upgrades he has elected to get from the House of Wisdom. We've got, uh, this is of course the blacksmith. We've got full melee attacks here for the men at arms. We've got melee armor coming in. He's been doing a great job upgrading. Yeah. Uh, but what about uh, Jim Rising's House of Wisdom? He, he, did he go with the trade wing? Let's see. Uh, yeah, trade wing. Okay, so he hasn't gone for the culture wing where you can get cheaper upgrades. He's gone with the trade wing, so he's got access to that imperial upgrade that can generate bonus resources, gold, and other things if he manages to get that. And then he can get some really, really good trading going on. So what is trading and how do you do it, uh, Moltrap? Great question. Yeah, it's usually not a, a, a much of an issue on this map in the early games. We didn't mention it before, but there's a trade post on either side, on each side, each side of the map, I should say. So either player can go for trading, and as you can see, there's some little traders right there. Those little horses with uh, packs on the side. They're kind of like a unique kind of villager that you can build. They're a worker unit, but all they do is go back and forth between your market and the trade post. Or in a team game, they can actually go back and forth between allied players' markets as well. And they bring in gold dependent on at a higher rate dependent on how far they are away. So you can actually put your market in the far corner of the map and have your trade routes produce more gold per minute that way um, because they're, it's it's a higher amount per distance, but it's more than the time it takes to travel that distance. So it's, exactly. it's going to be more lucrative the, the farther you go, basically. Yeah, it's and, not just uh, it yeah, took longer, so you get double. It took twice as long, you get double. No, and maybe if it took twice as long, you get triple, something like that. And, and crucially, though, it's the only way to get gold once all the gold veins have been mined out in the late game. And there's a limited number of resources on these maps. And oh, oh, oh Red Panda oh. sneaking some some men-at-arms rather through that gap um, before the wall is finished. It's going to be able to come in here and harass some of these villagers. And Delhi have very strong men-at-arms, actually. Their infantry are not what they're famous for, but they have some special upgrades to get bonus damage on them and, and what have you. So uh, he's going to be able to come in here and just chop down some villagers and force Jim Rising to respond. And again, this is just some harassment. This does not look like it's going to come into a full-on attack. But any way that you can pick down your opponent's infrastructure and their economy is going to make it so that you can have a better late game, especially if you control for relics and you're getting more money than them from non-villagers. Yeah, notably, uh, funnily enough, Red Panda, and that's, that's typical like puppy behavior where you want to play with the toy someone else is playing with. Uh, Red Panda <laughs> never got the relic on his own side of the map. He went for the contested ones. He's too busy managing his Imperial upgrade, the, <laughs> the Delhi boom. But he's got three and now a keep on the other side and he's got men at arms run by. And if we can take a look quickly at the, one of the men at arms for Red Panda, did he finish honed blades? We can also look at the House of Learning. Uh, what upgrades has he been getting uh, in general, if Ooh. we can find any men at arms, or we can go to the blacksmith or the madrasa, kind of see what Red Panda is working on. Kind of cute. He's harassing with spearmen this time, so that when the. Because his, his men at arms went in there and he said, oh, look, there's a bunch of camel archers and camels. And so instead of harassing with men at arms, he harassed with spearmen, for which are going to do better against them. Um, but again, it's just harassment at this point. And spearmen are also cheap. That might be. He may be thinking. What's a way that I can disrupt my opponent without spending too much resources? Exactly. And maybe he's just kind of throwing them away as well. Uh, I think the House of mm. Learning was all the way on the left, by the way. You see it on the minimap, uh, right under the gray mountain range, uh, if we want to take a look there in a bit. We can also see that tower elephants are being produced from the H4 landmark. There it is. So we're getting incendiary arrows. We've got the uh, infantry health and damage. Cavalry biology has been uh, queued up afterwards. And well, lots of town centers. But let, let, let's go look at the fight uh, under the mountain range. Yeah, it looks like we do have a little bit more harassment going on towards the middle of the map. And this is a cool strategy by Red Panda. He's he's not really going... He went for that, that frontal attack earlier, but he's going for a lot of harassment. And now he says, I've done enough damage with my harassment. I'm going for another frontal attack with elephants. He's put an offensive keep 
in his opponent's side of the map as a fallback point to her defenses. Ooh. Oh, sending in Spearman to attack the traitors is a clutch move, disrupting the economy hugely. Spearman, the traitors are cavalry, so they're actually going to go down very quickly to the Spearman. And I don't know if Jim Rising can focus his attention on this frontal attack and defend these harassments around the map at the same time in order to save his economy. It looks like he is going to send his uh, camels over to the right side there to take out those spearmen. But in the meantime, he's let Red Panda take full control of this middle area outside of his side of the base. Yeah, it looks like uh, Jim Rising made a bit of a faux pas. He went for the uh, send all my camel archers there just to deal with five spears. This is a multitask and over, uh, yeah, over stimulation issue, let's say, overreaction. A very nice split here from Red Panda. He comes in with the C formation, trying to dodge damage from Splash. Ironically, there is no Splash, no mangonels, just Bombards and Springles. The camel archers have been pulled away by just five spearmen. They're late to the battle. Elephants are coming in. There's lots of crossbows and archers here, but the camel archers are coming in from the flank. They are coming in from the flank. They finally rejoined the battle. Uh, most of the infantry, sorry, the melee infantry are dead. Both players trading blows there. So it's just going to be a battle of the archers. But if you have, well, actually, usually camel archers are not as good in a trading battle per cost, but he just has more of them, actually. So he's <laughs> actually going to force the archers back to the keep. Now, some of those are actually bowmen as well. They're not actually crossbowmen. Um, so they're going to be doing a little bit more damage theoretically on the, the camel archer side if they're more upgraded there. Um, and now he's pushing under, onto this keep, trying to blow it up, and he's just going to give it up. He does not have the forces to defend this. The bombard survived, or perhaps it died and there's another bombard here. So with that bombard advantage, he's going to be able to blow that keep up and demolish it. And uh, Red Panda says, alright, well I did some damage. I'm going to go ahead and retreat to my side of the map and uh, be content for defending now. And he can afford to do that. Red Panda has the walls. Uh, Jim Rising does not, so he's being forced to kind of defend when Red Panda invades, but not vice versa. Funnily enough, Red Panda Moltrap has 2,900 stone, so he can build a <laughs> bunch of keeps. <laughs> but uh, keeps cannot fire back at Bombards usually. You can get the Bombard emplacements, but it takes a while to get. Uh, a minute or so, it, you know, he may not have it yet. So. Bombards are now moving in. It's funny because I thought Jim Rising was losing control of the game. His traders disrupted, multi-prong attack. Didn't do some of the little late game value things like Relic and Sacred Side control. But he's got three Bombards. He's moving in. Yeah. And did did uh, Red Panda make a mistake there to move in like that? And like you said, these Camel Archers, they're actually really supply efficient. Yeah, they're super costly. Cost way more than an Archer, three times as much. Yeah. They're supply efficient, and we're looking at a 200 maxed out situation. So we've got far more resources pumped into each individual supply of unit for Jim Rising. That's why his Kama Archers are doing so good here. Yeah, if those of you watching do not know, um, in this game, every unit is one supply. You know, you Almost might be every. used to StarCraft, yeah. where sometimes there's six supply units, but you can have 200... Uh, villagers, or you can have 200 bombards. It's the same thing. And actually, we do have Jim Rising has broken through the map. His bombards have finally gone down, but he's broken through the defenses in the meantime. And Red Panda sending some more. He's done an excellent job with harassing the economy during every single battle. But um, Jim Rising felt like he had an opportunity to push through, but all of his siege units have been killed off by the enemy Springalds. So he does not have that tech advantage right now. All he has is these infantry, it's a few camel archers that he has left. He's forced to fall back, and he is bringing Whoa. in some more bombards, but they're being rallied into the front. They're going to get taken down by infantry without firing a shot. Oh, no, a huge pathing mistake there. He's going to lose so many, 2,000 resources in a matter of seconds here. But while those infantry are killing off his bombards, they are distracted, so he might be able to win the land battle there in front of his buildings. If he does not, he can start losing some of his infrastructure. Hardcore. No, actually, Jim Rising does have a keep of his own to fall back to as well if he feels like this is too dangerous, which it probably will be with that many. Uh, it looks like he might have hand cannoneers now as well and an elephant on oh, yeah. the front line in addition. And Jim Rising just doesn't have any siege units left to deal with this. Yeah, <laughs> kind of what, that's kind of what happens when you try to slap someone with the butt of a pistol instead of actually just, you know, firing the bullets that are inside <laughs> the chamber. <laughs> Jim right. Rising is like, I'm really creative. <laughs> I've got four bombards, but what if I reverse them and try to hit them with the back of it? Just back up real hard. <laughs> and it turns out it doesn't work that well, actually. No, it doesn't. Just he tried to run run them over with the the it's like it's like that scene in Austin Powers where there's the steamroller <laughs> traveling at 0. 0.5 no! miles per hour trying to run them over. You can just walk out of the way and then you can well, I guess in that case you could light the steamroll on fire with your torches, as all infantry have. Um 
infantry can do bonus damage to uh, both buildings and siege units. So if you can get on yeah. top of their siege units, you can kill them very quickly with infantry. That is a ton of camel archers, though, by the way. And it looks like he has men-at-arms behind it to rush through and engage the front if he gets put upon. And we are having another skirmish here. The rams are pushing through, so he has to worry about it on the side. But winning this battle is key to being able to fall back and actually deal with that. He's fighting... In range of the keep, though, the Bombards and Springles doing damage, too, but it looks like he might just have too much infantry. He's got a little bit of a surround. The Men-at-Arms getting on top of the Hand Cannoners as well. That's exactly what wanted to have happen. He's diving on top of the Springles Ooh. with the Camel Archers, taking a lot of damage and having to fall back again. That might have been the opportunity for Red Panda to push back. It looks like he was falling back, but now Red Panda, with another Elephant coming to the front lines, might be able to take the advantage back again. The keep still going strong. Firing heavily, Bombards and Springles firing down on the front line as well. And indeed, Jim Rising forced to fall back to his defensive line. Yeah, I've never quite seen a game like this, Mole Trap, with such an epic battle of camel archers uh, being such a staple <laughs> unit here. And then Springles keep so close to each other. Hell, they're on the same screen. These incendiary arrow camel riders right. are really ava availing themselves heroically. But diving that deep to take down 500 resource Springles seems like a costly endeavor. Yeah, and if, if he hadn't microed them back, he could have picked off a couple of those spring alds. I think he's thinking, okay, I've got uh, these bombards coming out. I need them to be able to do damage. If he's got a handful of spring alds, they're going to get picked off. Um, so it was kind of like a gambit. Can I get on top of those spring alds and kill them off quickly enough? Generally, though, you're going to want something other than archers for that, and uh, this is exactly why. They can't quite take them down fast enough if they micro away. That keep has been absolutely crucial for Red Panda, though. It's been just a beautiful defensive point for him to fall back to in each of these engagements, and and the last couple battles have happened within range of it, so it's been able to fire out as well. That is a lot of villagers mining stone. I guess, I guess that answers the question, does he have the stones? Yes, he does. <laughs> And remember at the start of the game when we introed the map and we talked about the gold at the major pass opening, those, the gold that is contested, Jim Rising does not have access to those. We've got a 4,000 and an 8,000 gold patch on the left side of the map that have both been sectioned off smartly by Red Panda. So in the zero-sum game of resources that are exhaustible, Red Panda carved a bigger piece of the pie. But Jim Rising has been more proactive uh, with the market trading. Yeah, yeah, both of them having... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little surprised that we didn't see uh, Red Panda shift into getting some traders, actually. Uh, maybe he does at this point, but we haven't seen them. But this is really interesting. We're actually having a camel rider archer... Sorry, camel <laughs> archer run by, harassing the enemy economy with camel archers. And, you know, they are very cost... They're very high damage units, and they're very mobile is the key. Uh, Red Panda doesn't really have anything mobile enough to deal with these archers, so they well, can kind of run rampant and kill villagers. You say that, but uh, Delhi has that special upgrade, the Forced March. Oh, that's true. Right? So that's you, true. Uh, let's explain to the viewers that may not know it. Uh, it is an activatable on hand cannons, cannoneers, men at arms, spears, and archers. You can activate it once every, I don't know, 30 or 45 seconds? And then it lasts oh for 10 seconds until you issue an attack command, and then it's interrupted. What it does is it doubles your movement speed during that uh, space, space of time. You are able to, let's say if you are a, you know, by the way, I think he just got elite camo arches. I'm not sure if he had it before, but they're golden now. And mm. I must admit, I didn't see them golden before. So it seems like Jim Rising may have been, if I'm not mistaken, fighting at a deficit of uh, veterancy. But uh, mm. just mentioning, they get double movement speed. For Warcraft 3 viewers, it's like speed scroll on on steroids. Like, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I think the, the visual on those camel archers changed before our eyes there. Look sorry at all interrupt. those idle uh, farms. Moltrap, sorry to interrupt. We just had Red Panda's game and PC crash. Oh, no! It's extremely unfortunate. Uh, I don't think we actually have a graphic screen prepared for the unlucky eventuality of a, uh, a game crash. I was always hoping that we wouldn't get to this space. Uh, with... Wow. And, and, and usually when you crash, there is a small period of time where you can't control your SIF. That's the way it works in the netcode of Microsoft and Relic and Age of Empires 4. So this is extremely unfortunate. We had an extremely competitive game with villager count roughly quite equal. Red Panda lost yeah. some of those probably during uh, the demise of his computer. And we're going to have to kind of discuss with admins here what the right call is to do, and we'll inform you when we know more. But yeah, we'll, we'll let you know. We'll let you know. It was a really <laughs> cool game, but it, it wasn't over. 
Yeah, no, not by. I was very confused because kind of as you were saying that, I saw the the ending screen come up, and mm. I was like, well, it didn't look like it was in a situation where one player would GG because sometimes you, if the player surrenders, you just kind of suddenly, if you're watching as an observer, you suddenly see the match complete, even if you're not uh, knowing why. And it sounds like we do have word coming down from the administration that the win is going to be going to Jim Rising. Uh, the rule book that was distributed to everyone long in advance mentioned that it was up to every player to make sure that their equipment was ready and that their internet was uh, reliable. And so in this case, the win is going to be given to Jim Rising. And uh, so, Here, yeah, you're right. Problem. That game was not over by any means, but unfortunately yeah. that's kind of how it goes here's the problem if we are at lun if we're at a network situation and one of the pcs disconnects it is the fault of the organizer none of the players can be uh, like blamed for it whatsoever but we have this situation where we've got a, a 35 minute game where one of the players disconnects uh, it's extremely unfortunate but uh yeah it looks like jim rising will be awarded the victory for this one uh yeah, uh, it sucks. You can never make everyone happy, but like if it happens again, do you regame again? Are you regaming the whole night? And we've got a schedule to keep up with as well. So yeah. it, it does suck a lot, <clears throat> but uh, Jim, Jim will be taking the victory there. Uh, he did build up a good Bombard and Camel Archer army as well. And yeah, that's uh, that's how it goes. Yeah. And you also have to make considerations for, you know, if you allow for disconnects to interrupt a game, then it opens it up for players to be able to use that you know, intentionally as an advantage. And I'm just saying that hypothetically, I don't think any of these players are, you know, dishonorable in any way, but that's kind of what you have to build into it just in case, just to make sure that the gameplay is uh, is fair. So yeah, so Jim Rising is going to take the first game uh, by default there in that situation, which means we're going to have Honor versus Neely coming up uh, pretty soon. And you know what? That game, uh, that game made me pretty hungry. I'm going to have a little bit of a snack, I think. And Twitch chat... I usually get my snack recommendations from Twitch chat. Twitch chat keeps saying that that mangoes are really good in uh, Age of Empires 4. So I think I might have a mango. Do you know why you, mangoes you are good for Age of Empires 4 playing? You, you throw know. them at people, right? I guess so. And, and you know, there's this a big is splash. Mangoes are actually, it's unfortunate we didn't see a deli win in this case because uh, mangoes are actually a sacred fruit in India. So <laughs> anyway, let's get into our second game, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to see our picks uh, for the second map. Uh, there's only two maps remaining, and it looks like uh, the, in this case, losers, although we're going to put losers with an asterisk in this instance, uh, have picked Lippany for the second map. And, you know, uh, Moltrap, if uh, if we're going to get more mangoes in the next game, can you throw it at the camera after the second game to see what kind of <laughs> splash it would make? <laughs> That's right. Mangoes do splash damage. <laughs> You're a man of the people, right? Don't don't fail us on this. But okay, the, the, okay. the losing team here takes the second map, and they will be electing to go with Lippany over King of the Hill. Now, King of the Hill is a map with very little wood, a fairly short rush distance, and a lot of resource scarcity. If you play there into Mongols, usually you could have the problem that they end up tower rushing your wood, and you could be out of options real quick. They know that Neely is the remaining player who will be playing Mongols. So, so they'll be removing King of the Hill and going with Lippany for honor to play his Rus against Neely's Mongols. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting map. There are three sacred sites on this map and they're kind of spaced out around the map. So it means that you kind of have to play the whole map in order to control those objectives if it does get to an objective control game. But uh, as you said, it, with the Rus in play on this kind of a map, it's a good map for Rus to be able to spread out put hunting cabins in different places to get gold, be able to run around. There's not a lot of obstacles. There are some like um, hills that are going to block them, but for the most part, they can run around and get to different places where the hunts are, if they're going to go for the professional scouts and collect the deer to bring them back. So, um, but they're going to be up against the Mongols, who are also an extremely mobile civilization, perhaps the most mobile in that, I mean, they're the only civilization that can actually literally move their buildings from one place to another, like a t floating Terran building, for example. So it may be an early battle where both players are trying to control those resources on the round of the map. Yeah, exactly. And uh, action is going to be live from second one of that game because every single you move you do in Age of Empires for matters. Uh, just leisurely scouting around the map doing this and that is not the name of the game when you're Rus against Mongols. Mongols are the Sith that can put the earliest aggression 
plopping down a barracks or a stables as early as one minute into the game. Whereas Roos will always play a mini game with their opponent of Animal Collection, the destruction systematically of all fauna on the map. Sad, it seems, but it's just a game. And why do they do that, Moltrap? Uh, basically, the deer that are on the map are the har fastest harvesting food that you can get early on. Boar are technically harder, uh, more better to get, but boar are hardcore. You need a small army to kill a boar in order to harvest that meat. So if you can get early deer, you can get uh, basically an advantage over your opponent who's harvesting sheep or berries. And if you can go around and use the professional scouts upgrade, which allows your scout units to pick up those deer and bring them back under the safety of your town center, you can have a huge food economy going into the mid game. And if you can get all those deer and your opponent doesn't, it could be a really big advantage. Um, but yeah, Mongols can do that also. Every Civ can get that upgrade. The reason why we see Roost do it a lot is because they can actually produce scouts from their hunting cabins instead of their town center. So they don't have to interrupt villager production to make those extra scouts. Mongols can produce a stable to make extra scouts though as well, and they can use their Uvu to double produce them. So I think it probably will end up in a fight over those deer with tons of scouts and maybe even uh, level one horsemen running around the map. Exactly. That's what we could see unless some of them throws a curveball at the other, kind of like uh, Red Panda did in the previous game with the fake ram attack. And the final reason that Roos wants to go kill these animals, they're worth gold. Every single sheep, oh, yes. wolf, deer or boar that are killed offers immediate single uh, single serving gold into the coffers of the roost player and it ends up actually counting towards a total tally as well a score sheet of a bounty generation get more bounty and they reach three thresholds of bonus villager gathering rates global game-wide uh, for the rest of the game uh, for themselves so the more animals they kill the more food gathering rate they have and they even start generating more passive gold per hunting cabin around the map and when roos wants something then the opponents want to deny that very same thing yeah and it, it gets you in, in, into an interesting situation where you often have roos utilizing that gold where you don't even need to put villagers on your gold mine sometimes because yeah. you can get so much passive gold from killing animals and from your hunting cabins that you can get enough to get to age two, you know, or even up to age three without really investing a lot of your villagers on actually mining that gold, which means they can be mining, harvesting rather that really delicious deer meat, or they can be doing, doing other kinds of harvesting as well, potentially even getting stone for an extra town center. Although I don't, have you seen Roos go for a fast town center very often? I don't think, I don't feel like I've seen that happen too often. Yeah. So that was kind of the meta about four weeks ago, halfway the game's lifespan. <laughs> yeah. It's been out for two months. <laughs> Remember that when the game was half as old as <laughs> All it was now? Ago. Yeah. Uh, so back then people were figuring out if they go up to H2, the feudal age with the golden gate landmark, they can spend 200 gold mm. to buy 300 stone, yeah. which is very cheap. Other sips will spend 516 gold at their respective markets. Roos can do it for 200 gold, uh, almost three times as cheap. They can easily buy 300 stone, gather the wood, and then plop down a second TC. And we saw this a lot, but about three to four weeks ago, the emerging meta started happening more and more. It was shown a little bit in the Genesis tournament, which happened seven weeks ago, and we saw uh, no more second town centers. Roos getting all their resources from the quick warrior monks, taking sacred sites around the map and bringing back relics, getting gold from hunting cabins, bounty, all those extra sources, hightailing it to Castle Age and then going for some horse archers. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be very common. Um, it, it's just kind of all the Roos strategies playing well together. The ability to make scouts to get the deer, the deer to get more food income so you can get to fast castle and then you have the warrior monks which are the only religious unit in the game that can ride a horse and attack which means if they get assaulted by a wolf along the way they can kill it themselves they don't have to wait for an emergency spearman to come save them and they can actually get to those relics faster once they secure them it's very unlikely they'll be, pick, be able to pick off we saw in the last game that the scholar went in and grabbed the relic and a couple times the scholar was killed off slowly meandering back to the safety of the base but that won't happen with roos uh warrior monks they can get back very quickly so um that seems to be definitely the the main roos strategy is to go for the deer go for the fast castle go for the relics and then you've got a huge economy 
in the late game to do whatever the heck you want, basically. But, you know, if you know your opponent's going to do that, and you know exactly kind of what their strategy is probably going to be, you can plan to disrupt that. And the Mongols are going to be the perfect civilization to disrupt that with. Do you, do you have any ideas, actually, off the top of your head? How would a Mongol player, they're playing on disrupting the scouts and the fast castle strategy, what do you think they would do? A, a tower rush like we've seen done as a kind of a cheesy attack or something more complicated? Yeah, it's interesting because Mongols are, we were discussing before the show began just now, you were saying how Mongols are one of the most versatile uh, civilizations there are. They have great options for booming, uh, expanding their economy, but they can also be aggressive in a multitude of ways. So they can go with the early stables, like you said, get some of their own scouts. Scouts do bonus damage to other scouts, so you can match scout for scout. Or they could get the horsemen, which are a little bit faster and more resilient against enemy scouts as well. You could also make a barracks, park several spearmen around every congregation of deer carcasses. And while you can't outrun scouts, you do stress your opponents multitasking by needing to take circuitous routes with their scouts around the spears, which have been stationed on the carcasses. Don't look for a second and you'll quickly lose your scouts to the spears, uh, disrupting your economy and your strategy. Or Mongols can just try to get to the carcasses quicker get their own upgrades quicker and take those carcasses and it's actually an arms race of retrieval and finally they can be proactive and like you said tower rush and disrupt the opponent that way the game is already loading we're waiting for the observer delay to catch on so we're almost about to jump uh, to be able to jump into the game yeah i'm excited about this these are the number one and number two picked civilizations in the snake draft ladies and gentlemen the mongols versus the Rus, and i think most High-level players would regard these as the two most desirable and strongest civilizations as well. So we're going to have two very high-level players and two very high-level civilizations duking it out here very, very soon. And I can't wait to see... Because like I said, both these players have a lot of experience. So, you know, we may even see uh, Honor like we saw with the fake Ram. He may go for a fake Castle Rush, you know, meta <laughs> root strategy and then mix it up and hide a barracks in the corner and go for a Ram Rush or something like that. Who knows what'll happen? Um, but it, but... It's interesting you bring that up because when people talk about roosts, they think of early scouts, animal killing. They think of professional scouts, deer retrieval strategies, a fast H3 with their castle, and then horse archers. But that isn't because roosts have no other options. That is because this is the best, easiest thing to do for roosts. They have many other options. They could go to castle age. World's your oyster, mate. You can go for Magnels, you can go for uh, the, the fast expansion. Instead, uh, you can even get uh, barracks and men at arms, or you can go for crossbows. There's many different options. And Bonjoa showed with their first game with Red Panda, even though the game dragged on beyond it, that they come prepared. And that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They've, I mean, these players have, have been, uh, were invited weeks ago and they've known their civilizations for a week now as well, and they've known the map pool. So um, I'm excited to see what other stuff these players are going to pull out here. And I will mention one other thing, again, for people who may not be too uh, experienced with this game. Uh, something you often see if you know your opponent is going to rush for relics, especially with uh, you know HRE, for example, you often see players go and actually build like a little wall around <laughs> the relics so that it's harder to get in there and grab them. Mongols cannot build any walls, by the way. Oh, yeah. So, so that's that might be a, a something that affects the strategies that you won't have that kind of defense. But we're gonna get into the game and see exactly what they are gonna do. Bonjour Honor versus GL Neely. Let's go into game number two of the Castle Cup. All right, we're loading in. It's gonna be Lipany. Lipany is a map that is a, a kind of a square. You start on a roughly symmetrical landscape, but like we said, it's RNG. It's randomly procedurally generated. Uh, wood supply is decent, especially in the start. And you can kind of see that wood availability starts mm -hmm. to inch towards the center, kind of forcing engagements. You also always have several different high grounds and movement blockers that allow for natural areas to defend uh, their terrain. So the first question that we're always wondering in, in the start, will the Mongol player, Neely in this case, the, the red player, will he train a second scout? So we can look at his town center and see if it's all villagers or if he's gonna get a second scout. And this can help Neely uh, prepare to kill some of the animals that might otherwise give honor uh, some resources. So if we can see the Mongol town center, 
and we can ascertain whether he's going for the second scout or not. Yeah, we do see Honor already traveling on the map. He's collected two. He's about to get a third wolf into his retinue. And that's interesting. They are following his scout there, just like the sheep are. But again, in case you're brand new to this game, the wolves are attacking him. The sheep are being herded by that scout. So they're going to, but they don't attack very hard. So he's going to just go ahead and take his time killing off some deer. Just casually murdering every animal on the map while he's on his way around collecting deer. And he's collect he's hit the wolves to aggro them so that they'll follow him. So he essentially gains control of them so he can kill them later to get the gold off of it. And we can see that. Oh, there we go. An early there barracks. This can only mean one thing. Well, it could mean all kinds of things. He could cancel it, be like <laughs> trolled. <laughs> but this means that Neely will be going with early spears. Now, what ho what russ generally has what russ has in the start is scouts and villagers their outposts cost 175 wood outposts are a primary defensive structure and while every sith can make them for 100 wood it's 75 percent more expensive for russ even if they're stronger they're slower yeah. to build and they cost more for the mongols it's quite the opposite 70 wood only so if you have spears they counter scouts they counter villagers they can be a defensive a squad that defends the creation of outposts near an opponent and we call this the tower rush and the, every rts game that has defensive structures have had them <laughs> abused and built in the wrong place like we go through this phase right that's true there has been cannon russians i've even seen sunken colony rushes in the days uh you're right there's they're supposed to be defensive buildings but they're always used for offense in some sort of cheesy way by players that can figure out a way to do that and that's that's part of the fun as well but um yeah I, it looks like we are going to see that uh being the the situation here and now the thing is now correct me if i'm wrong my interpretation from what i've seen and heard is that when you know you're being tower rushed often mm -hmm. the vulnerability there with the, with the mongol tower rush is the villagers because the villagers have to be yep. the, are the only ones that can build those outposts and if you kill the villagers they cannot build those towers they cannot use those towers to use the spears defensively and to kill villagers at range. That's right. And so that's what we're going to probably see Honor focusing on here, I think. Yep, that's right. And those villagers can be attacked by scouts. You can maximize your damage by animation canceling your scout backswing attack. And that allows you to get more attacks in. But as it stands, and it quite literally stands, those two villagers have been found out and the spears are nowhere near. He's going to try to make outposts to harass eventually the worker line, but the scouts have found oh. it. Now, Honor is quickly sending scouts to start doing four damage per hit into villagers. The spears were too far, but they're getting near, and that pushes away the scout. Yeah, scouts are, you know, you start off with them, so you couldn't have them be very strong. They actually take a long time to kill villagers. Um, if the spears weren't there to uh, babysit them, then they could eventually... But uh, it looks like, and actually, let's see. So we have Bondra Honor up to three scouts now on the side. So if you get a good squad of scouts, you can kind of mow down the villagers uh, before they can kill them. But with those spearmen there, they're not going to be able to. And actually, he's running the spearmen around behind. Um, he's going to do a little bit of scouting and harassment with his con as well. And um, yeah, so Honor is not going to be able to respond to this first outpost. So we're going to see Neely get... A defensive con. Oh, he's actually fighting the con, trying to kill the con. The spearman getting hits down. Nothing dies right now, but a lot of damage being done to both sides. Relatively small initial armies right now. Yeah, and so the situation we have is that normally honor, if left alone, is gonna go castle age at seven plus minutes. Being harassed like this, he's got to make a choice. Does he think that he can still make it all the way to castle age, and that these outposts are unthreatening right. enough to ignore? Or is he going to power build an archery range, try to snipe from a distance? And we do see that archery range coming out. So he's like, until here, but no further. The, the tower actually is starting to hit the lumber camp. If villagers get too near at all, you can quickly start losing them uh, unsuspectingly. And that's happened to me all too often. The town center now is actually in fire of the villagers. Neely is too close. He's losing oh, his no. villagers to the town center. He's he lost know. one. The second one is about to go down. He can pull it back still. No, the arrow lands and he's going to cancel that as well. He was trying to push forward a little bit, a little bit so that his second tower, his second outpost rather, would be within range of those villagers and make sure he can close off the lumber. When you do a tower rush like this, that's kind of what you want to target is the lumber most of all. You're going to stop them from building. You're going to stop them from repairing. And lumber is necessary for all the tier one and tier two units as well. 
Um, so if he was able to get that lumber, he could he could close it off and really shut down the economy. But yeah. losing those villagers is huge because now he can just shift his villagers over to the side where that first tower doesn't have range and uh, start to power up his economy after all. Yeah, that is a, a big haul in the sail of the sailing boat of Nili. He was looking to make good headwind, but it uh, looks like it is actually blown up in his face, sadly, for him. Mm. He has no villagers inside the outpost, no spearmen, so it is not actively shooting presently. He could just park his spearmen in there and say, well, I hope some of your villagers mine as deep into the mines as the dwarves at Moria. They end up dying mm. to my spearmen shooting arrows into you. But he's relocated his spearmen, perhaps in an attempt to deny future professional scouts. Yes, exactly. The parking the nice. spear on the carcasses strategy. Very good. Yeah, very, very nice. Good good call for him to go and protect those deer. He's got enough spearmen that if a scout gets close enough, all of them, they may actually even one or two shot the, uh, the scouts, basically, with that many spears. Um, Honor just going ahead and collecting the deer that are nearby him. Uh, some people might think, okay, well, they're right nearby. Why not just build a mill? But it's just safer to have the next to your town center. You don't have to switch back and forth between locations for mining. And it looks like he's saying, okay, I know because my opponent has gone for this early attack that um, he's not going for professional scouts also. I can kind of take my time. I don't have to run out and try and get the farther deer carcasses first and bring them back early. I could be more efficient and bring the closer ones back first because it's very unlikely that Neely is going for the same strategy. He's about to finish Feudal Age with the Deer Stones, which is going to mean that he automatically gets the upgrade that will make it so that all of his units, all of his units will be influenced by the Yam Aura, which gives them increased speed uh, within range of outposts or the Deer Stones themselves. So um, it's very common when you go for that that he's going to be able to go for more aggression in the mid game. Uh, with the ability to put some speed on there. What do you think? Is he going to follow up with, you know, continued aggression, try and get some rams to go with this? Or is he going to try and just use this um, to try and catch up economically? I'm not sure which direction he's going. It's kind of hard to tell. It is hard to tell, and I think the options are still open. So we can see that he had a delayed uh, transition into the feudal age because of the early investment into outposts and spears. And I often like to quip that Mongols go straight... Oh! Uh, that Mongols go straight from Dark Age into Castle Age, kind of skipping <laughs> the feudal. And it's kind of that aura of fear, not just the Yam aura, but the fear aura in that Mongols are the aggressor that gives them almost illegitimate leeway to go straight into the uh, next phase and get some many times in Lancers. But as it stands right now, I'm not sure in what position Nili is actually in. His outpost is actually starting to shoot villagers. We'll check back there later to see how many end up dying. Nili blunders into town center range with two spears and his Khan, and they end up falling. And a little cute touch by Honor, who seems to be quite well prepared for shenanigans of this sort. He has a small expeditionary force of villagers in yeah. the far north side of the map where he's got a little lumber camp expedition that was his concession towards saying like, hey, if I ever lose my main wood line, and it looks like that may actually happen, I've got a fallback point. My wood is partially guaranteed in the north side of the map. Really neat. Yeah, very clever. And also just utilizing one of the sort of natural advantages and synergies of the roost that they actually collect more lumber when their lumber camps are next to an outpost. And so having the outpost there is a strong outpost. He can use it to defend his villagers, but it's also going to increase the production. So it serves dual purpose there, and it's going to mean that if he does have to fall back to that northern point, uh, it'll be very effective. And it's a good spot, too, because it's, it's he's built it in the opposite direction of his opponent. So if his opponent goes all the way up to the north there to try and harass that spot, it'll be difficult to harass, and he may be leaving himself open to counterattack. Now, despite all this pressure, Mole Trap Honor has seen fit to start yes. his Castle Age landmark. And he's power building it with 15, 15. villagers. That's insane. Wow. I believe it will only take about 40, 45 seconds or so. He started it roughly at the 9 minute 55 mark. So you can see how fast he's building that. Opportunity cost of gathering resources lost, but he gets there as quickly as possible. He's then going to get a warrior monk, get some relics, and secure some backup gold resources. But let's also take a look at the Neely space, the mm -hmm. Mongols, as we see that right here. He's got an archery range. There's a bunch of archers coming in there. He did delay Honor's Castle Age by quite a bit. You can reach it as early as mm -hmm. 8 minutes, 8.30. He's delayed it for 2 minutes. Yeah, and he's still putting pressure onto the wood line over here as well. 
these towers are basically not i mean arrows do almost no damage to buildings and so yeah. there, it's, not it gonna be, it's not going to be it's not going to kill like his a, base or anything like that but like, what's that? it's like a starcraft player uh, starcraft caster and so on for you and i isn't it weird to see that like towers <laughs> don't do anything against one another right you you'd think that with with several towers shooting your base you'd be a little worried but you could just basically ignore it <laughs> you know, it'll take it'll take him 10 minutes to do the damage that will take 30 seconds to repair if it gets to that point so you can kind of ignore it it makes sense though if you think about it like if you're shooting arrows at a building you're not going to destroy a building with arrows usually it's going to yeah, take several did. hundred of them but um anyway uh so he can kind of ignore that luckily he does have that uh lumber camp up at the top there but it also means that he's a little bit fen fenced in hemmed in by these towers it's going to be hard for him to move out and uh and go for an attack you know, I guess he can kind of go around in a way, but it's something he has to worry about, even though it's not going to kill his base. And we are having a little bit of a skirmish between archers here. Some expeditionary archers going to harass those lumbermen are being attacked by a slightly superior number. But Neely has extra archers coming in the side. He's going after the warrior monk as well, going for that first relic, being pumped out very quickly by the age three landmark um, for the roost. And it don't oh, looks like he might have to be go the other direction. Yeah, he's forced oh. to go away. So, but it looks like the archers, he basically didn't have all of his archers, I'm talking about Neely, didn't have all of his archers together. Half were attacking the enemy archers, half were attacking right. the monk. So he lost kind of both battles. He didn't kill the monk, he lost the other half of his archers, so he is going to be forced to let that monk get back to the abbey with the with the relic. Yeah, exactly. The, the You know, the, the warrior monk took about 100 damage, he has 190 health, very tanky individual. Uh, has a lot more health than some of the religious units for the other sifts. So one mm. relic has been successfully secured and the first knight is coming out. That's probably an early knight, even though Castle Age is ready for, uh, for, for, uh, for honor, he may not have upgraded its veterancy yet to become a full knight. And I guess it kind of depends whether uh, he upgraded that yet, because he's most likely focusing on horse archers. The first production mm. of them has been begun and Neely himself is just now slowly getting to begin his own castle age. He's got a few squadrons of archers, but he's unable to truly get a grip on the game, Moltrap. Yeah, he basically, he, he invested a lot. If you think of, you know, people use like the snowball uh, analogy a lot of the time, it, where if you have a bigger stone to begin with when you start rolling it down, it's going to get bigger faster. And by investing in that early rush attack, he basically is going into feudal with a smaller stone. And so he yeah. is not going to be able to build up his economy as quickly as fast going into the mid game. And so that's why we're seeing kind of behind. If he had accomplished some damage with that rush, it could be the opposite direction, though. If he'd been able to kill a lot of villagers and slow down honor faster, it could have gone the other way. So that's why he went for that strategy. We are seeing the step readout going down, though. This is a way that Neely can perhaps get back into the game economically. It's a landmark that collects 50% extra gold so it's basically, it's not just a faster harvesting rate, but it's actually extracting more gold than is present in that gold vein as well. And exactly. so with that, he might be able to get enough gold to equalize for the relics that um, Bonjoa Honor is collecting. Exactly. If you pick up 100 gold with 10 villagers, 10 each, they bring back 150. So you're yeah, you're upvaluing every node and you can move that landmark to new gold locations. So right. a lot of gold coming in there that could sponsor the production of mangonels, springles, men-at-arms, knights, or even, uh, they're called lancers, but it's the same unit effectively for Mongols, uh, or even mangidai. Now, just kind of talking about the meta game here, typically what you see from Rus is horse archers, a couple of warrior monks to provide an aura buff, and some scouts to tank and to burn buildings. The recent r emerging trend for Mongols has been to counter with Mangidai, likewise mobile ranged cavalry, and some lancers in front. The lancers are the tank, the Mangidai are a little faster than horse archers, and are the punishment for overextensions. However, Neely got to the castle age so late that he's been unable to build up a significant force of these, if that's indeed his chosen route of countering. It's not that he didn't slow down honor. We're just wondering if it has been enough. Yeah, and crucially, he doesn't have a large cache of stone and his Uvu has just depleted. You can use buildings around the Uvu to double produce units. So it's something he might, might have been able to kind of catch up produce a ton of Mangadai quickly if he'd had a lot of stone in the bank to consistently do that. 
but um, it looks like right now he doesn't quite have that mechanic to catch up. I'm seeing a little bit of skirmishing going on over here. Um, these uh, lancers are going to be, I'm sorry, these knights, I guess, are going to be chased away by some spearmen. So not too much damage done there. But um, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what Neely's plan is going to be here in this situation. He's got to try and catch up. He does have some tools to do it. Um, I will point out, by the way, that, that um, Mongols do have a lot of advantages with uh, trading. They get a lot of bonuses for trading. I don't think that's what he's going to go for here, but maybe yeah. if this goes into a super long game, that could be a way that he could kind of surmount the advantages that Honor's going to have with the relics. Um, anyway, but right now we just got Honor kind of having some map control, running around with his horsemen, and nearly giving chase, but not quite able to catch up. Yeah, so we we haven't really talked much about the Khan. You see the white horse there with the shooting archer on top. That is actually a unique unit. For Warcraft 3 fans, it may feel the most like a hero unit, as it is a respawning unique unit of which you only have one unique, uh, and only the Mongols have it. It offers bonuses to your faction. You can use abilities either for movement speed temporarily, attack speed for ranged units, or armor for all the units around it. And that can be pretty neat. You now have a few archers taking down a warrior monk. There's attacks everywhere. In true Age of Empires fashion, people have spread themselves over the map, even as the ram from Honor is trying to take down the outposts. Neely is ferociously defending it. Yeah, one of the reasons I like this game is, is I really like this dynamic that happens where, you know, in most of the games you have a base and you have a second base. And right. there's resources around the, map, around the map that you're going for as well. But a lot of the battles take place around destroying or, or putting up those bases. In this case, the whole map is kind of at odds. And you're putting your buildings to collect resources in different places where the resources are. And so you have to be active around the entire map in the mid and late game of this game because there's going to be stuff going on everywhere. There's going to be villagers spread around the map and you have to be aware of where they are. You have to be harassing all over the map where they are. You have to be aware of different objectives around the map as well. It's It gets pretty bonkers with, with things being spread out and attention being spread out as well. And speaking of which, we do have a couple um, knights coming in here to harass these uh, villagers investing in the food. And actually, they're going to bypass the food and go for the gold. Those, those villagers run away, and he's going to go back for the food villagers. He might get a kill or two here. But nice uh, reaction by Neely, protecting them. But, you know, he's got to be a little bit worried while those knights are there. The knights are not going to take very much damage from that outpost. He's going to have to send some spearmen to deal with this. He's actually mobbing the knight with the villagers as well. And while he's harassing on the other side as well, spearmen soaking up the knight damage while his archer's trying to kill the Mangadai in the background, it looks like. And it looks like there's just going to be too many units for honor, though, I think. Yeah, horse archers in the back line, knights in front. These are upgraded knights. They have four armor. They take at most four damage from the archers if they're fully... Uh, yeah, I think if they're upgraded with veterancy, we'll kind of have to see how much piercing damage they do. But these oh, wow. villagers have been disrupted. The archer force has been destroyed. I think it will be a good time to maybe get a villager count, but it looks like Banjwa Honor has killed far more than Gaming Legion nearly. Yeah, uh, look at that military tab. Yeah. 54 killed, and that's total units, including villagers and military units. Um, but compared to 17 killed by Neely, uh, Honor's definitely going to be an advantage here. And he's going in to kill more villagers here yet on this goal. He's continuing to harass that. He knows he just killed a bunch of Neely's army on a part, another part of the map. So he's like, all right, well, there's not a lot that, that Neely can be doing to defend this right now. He's probably going to send some spearmen in that direction, but oh, starting to take the sacred sites as well with a relic in hand. Double objectives <laughs> there for that warrior monk. Yeah, it actually says that, uh, I think it was the Chinese, or for once if it says, when you take a relic out of your monastery and you stand on the site, you generate even more gold uh, with it. Oh, but really? It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't work. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a, it says so in the tech tree, which I thought is kind of a oh. cool... Uh, <laughs> they thought of designing it that way, but not in the current iteration of the game. As uh, Wow, those knights were kind of uh, bugging out. Honor has one side. He's building a keep in the center at the second sacred side. He's attacking with knights. He's still retrieving carcasses. It looks like he has control of the game. Yeah, he's doing the classic... RTS strategy of when you're ahead, you get more ahead. And uh, utilizing the fact that he has an advantage and he's just killed off Neely's, uh, a chunk of Neely's army. Um, you know, if you know you have that advantage, you don't have to go for a kill. In fact, it's usually not the right move to go for a killing blow just off of some winning some skirmishes. But you can take control of the map, get more objectives, get more money, 
and uh, move towards winning that late game. Especially now that he's, by the way, we kind of saw it happening on the side. He's broken out. He's killed off all those little towers that were near his base. He's been collecting more and more relics. Um, I'm not sure how many relics he has right now, but I'm seeing only one on the minimap left, I think. I think he probably has three or four relics at this point in his control. Because I don't yeah. think Neely has gotten a, uh, a prayer tent yet, has he? I don't think we've seen religious units from, from Neely yet. He just kind of hasn't been able to afford it. Yeah, there's three in the uh, Abbey of the Trinity, and there's another one there in the monastery up there. So that's, yeah, yeah. four out of five. The, the other one is on the far left of the map. So again, uh, Banjwa team putting a greater emphasis on sacred site control than the Neely Jim Rising team, and also getting those relics back. And I love that you brought up how to get ahead in this game, because, you know, some of us, we've played multiple RTSs. In StarCraft II, when you're ahead, you typically either all in and win, or you take another expansion. Uh, in, in, in Warcraft 3, when you're ahead, you kind of zone out your opponent from being able to take creep camps. You take their creeps. Mm. Uh, you typically don't all in, but you take their creeps. In this game, there's so many options, actually, of what you do. You could go as some villagers. Nice pickup there for Neely. He's actually Ooh. denying what should have been a, a little soiree to go do a keep building in the center. So that's a nice pickup Ooh. for Neely. But in Age of Empires 4, you typically have many options. You can do an aggressive keep in your opponent's face, establish a foothold on their side, or you can go for a kill move, or you can do the greedy thing, save up resources with the space you've built up and go to Imperial Age to get a technological advantage. Yeah, and we do see some the decent harassment coming here from Honor. Now, Honor is ahead, but I will say this. Uh, Neely is doing what he needs to do to try and get back into this game, which is look at what his opponent's composition is and see if there's a way to counter it. I talked before about how sometimes lower tier units can actually counter higher tier units. And upgraded Spearmen, despite being Dark Age units, can actually do fairly well against Knights. He's also got, if I, I don't know if I saw it correctly, but three archer ranges. Hold that thought, actually, because he has horse archers of his own. I'm sorry, Mangadai ah. of his own coming in, and it just didn't have enough to deal with it. Giving up. Match complete. And uh, <laughs> we're seeing... It's the wrong Bonjois, but Bonjois does take the game there, which means that with the disconnect of Bonjois in Game 1, and now with a victory in Game 2, it's going to go to the two versus two match, ladies and gentlemen. Ah. It's going to be a 2v2 in our very first matchup, and I'm super excited about that. We're going to check out some of these stats here to see how the game went. And this is this line of the villager count kind of shows you yeah. a, a visual representation of what I mentioned of honor getting ahead and just kind of using that to get more ahead. And that's why the lines kind of go farther and farther apart as we moved along the course of the game. Yeah, exactly. We can see at the 15 minute mark, not only had Honor built up a significant lead by killing villagers, we also see a few periods where Neely maybe forgot to train villagers for a bit, or indeed lost one or two of them in those ill-fated tower rush attempts. And we can see that at the 15 minute mark, uh, the Roos player managed to throw up a second town center and further increase the income deficit. If we look at the total resources count and kind of see how much everyone gathered i'm sure we'll see a stark story of contrast as well uh yeah. how much uh, both of them managed to extract from the map you can if see that there, that there was a sorry go ahead no no go ahead there's a point on this map that we're looking, we're going to look at the that other resource map probably in a minute but you can see on this uh chart the military count nearly had a higher military count for a good chunk of the middle of the game but look at where that is that's when we had uh, Honor at age three and Neely at age two. So we had the, the numbers being in Neely's favor, but the advantage was actually going to Honor because his units were knights and they were horse archers, whereas Neely had mostly spearmen and some lower level archers. So the value is not necessarily represented in that chart. Yeah, if we, uh, we can uh, now see the economy tab and see how much they got in total. We see 12,000 food for our blue player here, mm. uh, which I forgot actually who the blue player was. I, I think that's uh, Honor. 12,000 foot yeah. against 9,000. He's got 7,500 wood against 4.4. And oh, yeah, double the gold. That's pretty Double, nasty. almost literally double the gold. And that is what you get when you get 10 minutes of sacred sites and relics chilling in your buildings. Um, a huge gold advantage there. And that's what allowed him to get 
or those higher tech units in the late game. I want to finish the thought real quick um, that I mentioned before with Neely. He did have his Uvu with three archer ranges on top because the thing is, the as I mentioned, that um, Honor's units were higher value, but that also means they're more expensive. And pound per pound, if you have horse archers with equal resources spent going up against normal archers with equal resources spent, the archers will be more numerous and they'll actually win out there. So putting three archer ranges on the Uvu, being able to pump those out in, in, in mass was kind of what Neely was going for. Unfortunately, he just kind of lost too much too quickly before he could try and implement that. He'd lost too many villagers that he couldn't actually put enough resources into making that happen. So, um, yeah, but it was, a, it was a valiant attempt at a comeback though through for several minutes. Yeah, exactly. And you know, of course, the horse archers always have that mobility and then there's the tech speed difference. All in all, a great play by honor. It does mean that we get to the 2v2 and we have a pre-selected map, but yes. we've only told the players which of three maps it could be. All two on two maps can be played over the course of this tournament, semis one, semis two and, and the finals. And it is going to be Mongolian, Mongolian Heights. Heights. Wow, a yes, two on two on Mongolian Heights. This is the map that is characterized by a river splitting two halves of the map. The teams will spawn together. There's one river in the center where fishing for food can be important, where fighting early on can be important. So we will have a, what was it? Rus plus Delhi, Bandra, uh, against the Jim Rising, Abbasid, and the uh, uh, the Mongol of Nili, in a two yeah. on two. And again, you know, we talked about how there's advantages and disadvantages to every civilization, but in a two versus two, you can often use your allies civ to make up for that. Mongols cannot make walls. And oftentimes on this map, there's there's the river going across, and then there's usually three or four uh, fords where you can walk across or you can use water units there. And those are defense points where you're defending your half of the map, basically. And um, in this case, you know, Mongols can't build walls to defend those spots, but, you know, uh, the Abbasids can and so you might have situations like that where you're going to be playing off. They're going to be playing off of each other's civilizations and accounting for the disadvantages. Um, exactly. Anyway, we are going to take a look at some highlights, I think, here from our first or second game as well and replay some of our cool moments. This is from the Tower Rush early on. And do you think there's a way Neely could... I mean, other than losing his villagers, but that was kind of a little bit later on, was there a way that Neely should have played this a little bit differently in order to get more damage done with this? Yeah, I think Moltrap, he was a little bit too impatient. First of all, there's the spacing issue. He was just a bit too close. Secondly, reaction time. Villagers took 10 seconds to die to the town center and he could have pulled them back. But besides those two, it's really a case of trying to do much. Perhaps afraid of Honor's skill in a longer game, had he not lost those villagers and sent them back to get resources or build more outposts on the other side of the uh, woods, you don't need to get something done with it immediately. The thing is, in Age of Empires 4, outposts are incredibly hard to clear up. Even if they offer no immediate aggressive benefit, yeah. they're still a defensive fallback point. They offer an insane amount of vision. They require a lot of resources and preparation and time to clear up for the True. adversary. And had he kept those two villagers alive, he could have made the opposite side outpost mm -hmm. quicker. And he could have even wrapped all the way around and build an outpost on the deer carcasses or mm, perhaps true. find the northern satellite lumber camp expedition thus eventually getting outpost arrow slit upgrades at feudal or even waiting to get spring old emplacements on the outposts and then he could really be a playing a boa constrictor style not giving any room to breathe to his opponent yeah yeah interesting um and it kind of felt like he uh once the tower rush didn't really work out as he planned, he tried to pull out of it and play into sort of a normal mid game. Um, you know, kind of, I think he recognized that he hadn't quite committed enough to the tower rush. And of course, losing those villagers was, you know, a mistake that, that slowed that down as well. But in that instance, he has to look at it and say, okay, well, this is the situation. Tower rush has kind of failed. What do I do next? Um, he kind of still built a couple more towers though. And those were annoying, but they don't didn't quite have the effect that he wanted because without yeah. being early enough, they couldn't quite be within range to really, you know, affect uh, Honor's economy, essentially. Yeah, that's true. And well, that was that game. Now we're getting to the two-on-two. -two and yeah. I was tuning in a little bit during the pre-run of today's show as the map vetoes were happening. And I tuned into Banjwa's stream 
and, and Honor and Red Panda were kind of agonizing about their vetoes for the one-on-one, -on -one, which have now ended up in a 1-1 one -one score. But I also heard, and I thought this was really cute, Honor was saying, uh, in German, of course, but he was saying that he's really looking forward to the two-on-two, so it should be so much fun. And more than just the prize money that's at stake, as two-on-two -two would only be played as a decider of the match and therefore securing your advancement into the finals, he said, more than the prize money, I just care about how much fun I think it's going to be. Uh, you know, them two uh, as friends playing together in a two-on-two -two yeah. and really just being exposed to a different format here uh, should be super fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. And one of the other cool things that we didn't mention before, uh, well, I guess we kind of sort of mentioned, is uh, this tournament has players from around the world, a lot of different countries. And so we're actually going to have uh, Neely and Jim Rising. Neely is German as well. Jim Rising is Mexican. He's His native language is Spanish. But they both speak English, by the way, pretty well. So they're going to be able to communicate in this 2v2 pretty well. And you know what? This uh, this game is me hungry for another snack. I have another snack I want to have here, but... So I've got a, I've got this pair, right? But I have, I have another pair also, and I don't know which one is better. I think only there was some way to find out which pair is better. Maybe some sort of tournament <laughs> to find out which pair is the better pair. Oh my and, god. Uh, we could... He thought about it, guys. <laughs> So uh, maybe I'll make this the uh, the Jim Rising Neely pair and this the Bonjoie pair, and I'll eat whichever one is victorious after the games. I'm having second thoughts about my pair now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we are loading the game right now. Um, it's going to be a few minutes while we wait for the buffer to go through. We want to make sure that there was a delay just in case, uh, you know, there's no ability for anyone to kind of tune in live and feed information. Again... Just saying it uh, for the record, that's why we plan tournaments this way, that way. Not because I suspect anyone would do anything like that in this tournament. It is, as you said, a pretty fun invitational, and all these guys are very honorable. And uh, yeah, I'm glad that you said that, because it's pretty cool that they're they're thinking of it that way, because this is a really fun format. So I'm having fun casting it. It's going to be fun. Same. Now, Mole Trap. Let's talk about these four sieves and how they fare on water maps, in particular hybrid maps on Mongolian Heights. I'll just quickly rattle off the civilization specific advantages of each one. Delhi starts with bonus wood because the devs thought they may want to make an early mask. They actually start with more wood than other civilizations, which is very un Starcraft like, where everyone <laughs> starts with the same uh, amount of resources, if not the same units. They also, their fishing boats have archers on them that deal 7 damage, allowing them early Dark Age supremacy. Then, Jim Rising, his Abbasid dynasty, their docks cost half the amount of lumber, 75 instead of 150, allowing them to mushroom around the map with multiple docks. Mongols, as we saw in the previous game and may see again, are able to double produce early units, scouts, horsemen or spears, Half the cost, double the production speed as someone else, allowing them to use outposts and early units to deny enemy docks and defend their own. And Honor, finally, as a Roost player, he can make scouts from hunting cabins. He can generate extra wood via the wooden fortress to get more uh, yeah, wood gathering, basically, for future docks. But not usually the civilization that's super happy to play water maps, although here he's got no choice. Additionally, at the second age, Rus can turn all of their fishing ships, or some, into warships, Loggia attack ships, in just 20 seconds, basically allowing them a snapshot of bonus production, where other ships need to wait for their feudal to kick in and slowly start ramping up army units on the water. They can do one big splash, make a big splash with their water. Yeah, and I think we probably are going to see... Uh, a lot of early conflict around the water, based on what you were saying before. Um, we may see Neely, as you said, pumping out with the Uvu extra spearmen early on to try and contest those Delhi Sultanate docks uh, early on. It seems to be kind of one of the main ways that you can stop Delhi from taking that early advantage is if you can slow down their docks fast enough. Um, because, yeah, and if you guys don't know, by the way, uh, the reason why the fishing is so important is if you think about it, We've talked about how getting a second town center is good because you can produce more villagers. You can produce twice as many villagers, you're going to get twice as much investment in income. And the docks function like it's extra town center because you're able to produce extra boats to get more fish. And so it's a very cheap way of getting a fast early economy. And it looks like we do have the game queued up, ladies and gentlemen. Jim Rising and Neely versus the Bonjois, Red Panda, and Honor. Our first 2v2 of the match. 
the deciding game for the semifinal. Let's get into it. All right, here we go. We can see that uh, it, it has begun. Uh, so let's take a look. Let's take stock of the situation. In the top right, right side of the map, we've got the blue and yellow team of Jim Rising and Nili, who, thank you, Age of Empires and Relic, are not listed together in the score sheet in the top left. But it's okay. <laughs> They've got their team number in front of them. So it's blue and yellow, Abbasid and Mongol, Jim Rising and Nili on the top right. And on the bottom left of the map, we've got green and red, Honor and Red Panda, of Team Banjwa, playing as Delhi and Roos. Yes, indeed. And this is a very interesting map. It's it's a it's going to be really cool for a two v two because it's a, it does lend itself really well to having the sides kind of split on opposite sides of the river and a lot of uh, battles over control of the river crossings uh, and that sort of thing. There are two markets and two sites. Each end of the river has a market on one side and a and a sacred site on the other. Um, and then on the other side of the river, it's split so that there's one sacred site on each side of the map and one market on each side of the map. Usually, there is kind of a big ridge around the back, which is kind of a little bit of a protected area where there's a lot of resources. When this map spawns in a 2v2 mode, though, it tends to be a little bit more um, open. And so you can kind of see, if you look at the minimap, there's some sort of dark gray spots there where there's ridges, but they're not taking up the whole back lines. So if... We do have players harassing the, behind the bases of each other. It's going to be a lot more open and harder to defend in a 2v2 situation than you might yeah. be used to on a 1v1. Yeah, exactly. We're using one bigger map increment. Not micro, but small. When you play... Some of you may play Age of Empires 4 2v2 on the quick match, on the ladder. And there, there the map size used is medium. We're actually using small. So it's a bit smaller than the 2v2 you may be used to. It's a bit bigger than one-on-one. -on -one. On this map size, you actually have, let's see, one, two, three, four, seven relics instead of five in the one on one. Mm. But you still only have two sacred sites. And then there's also more deer camps. I believe there's seven of that as well, or six. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, seven deer camps instead of four. So a lot of interesting, maybe eight, maybe it's actually eight. A lot of interesting differences. And we can see that actually Honor and Red Panda Sif switched. So this oh. is allowed. It was always allowed. Yeah. They were also allowed to decide last minute who's going to play which Civ. We just asked them out of interest. They have access to the Civs that they have. I never expected anyone to actually make use of that. For them to play in two on two with swapped Civs. Yeah. And and speaking of things getting mixed up, uh, this map almost always spawns with the market and the sacred site on opposite sides of the river on each end. And in this case. It hasn't. In this case, there's a market and a sacred site on the same side of the river, on each end of the river. Oh, yeah. So that is a little bit weird as well. So we're having a lot of things kind of mixed up in this situation. Still one on each side of the river, though. So again, if they kind of, if you think of the river as a dividing line for territory, each side is still going to have a little bit of control. And I'm actually surprised that both players, all the players are kind of just letting each other do their thing and mine yeah. some, get some fish. Um, and actually, do the Bondra team... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the other team. Jim Rising and Neely, do they even have a docks? Or are they just ceding the river to the Bondra team? Yeah, so it is It is interesting. You see that the Delhi player, Honor, has gone for a quick dock. He's up to about five ships, which gather from shoreline fish at the same gathering rate that villagers would get from deer. So you can count mm. these five, four fishing ships as four extra villagers, so he's already getting more food. He's also mining with uh, villagers on Shoreline Fish. They actually have the second highest food gathering rate in the right. game, beaten only by ships on deep sea fish. It's better than boar even, or deer. Yeah. Uh, the Khan just died for Nili. He was doing a bit of scouting and he flew too close to the sun. We've again got spears and villagers coming, but not protected by the Khan. And in a two on two with the benefit of allied help, is he launching a one versus two assault here? Uh, it looks like he's trying to invade here. Now oh, these wait, are the only the blue scouts are here. Yeah, yeah, these are only scouts, so they're not going to be able to do too much damage. And he's kind of, kind of back going back and forth. He's actually forcing a outpost here. Although this is, I say forced. I don't know if this is forced by the scouts as much as it's forced by the scouts looking to pick up these deer as soon as this professional scout upgrade finishes. So he's actually trying to protect this location for trying to protect those deer carcasses for his side of the map. 
And the scouts are just like, well, you can't kill us. We're faster. But we also can't kill you because you're spearmen. So uh, there's a little bit of a standoff here. And neither player can really kill each other, but he is forcing yeah. a, a tower as well. It's kind of cool how this outpost has driven a wedge in between two friends, kind of uh, <laughs> spreading dirty lies uh, about each other. It's like, you know what your friend said about you? There's a wedge between them now, and it's all Nili's making. Jim Rising using his scouts here to defend as well. But Is archers that... are coming out already. Is that... I think that's two hunts next to each other as well. That's a lot of deer carcasses yeah. in that location. So it's not surprising that they're going to try and defend this spot. Two deer uh, sets of deer carcasses right between their bases. This is a prime resource for their team if they lose control of it. And again, these scouts don't have the upgrade yet, though. So they're just chilling. I'm not sure he's going for it. I think they're here just purely as a combat unit. We can see Jim oh. Rising is starting to gather stone, which means this oh, is a distraction okay. technique that... We're, that basically slows down roots from getting horse archers too early. The villagers yeah. will try to get into the outpost together with the spears. One will go down. This is a distraction technique allowing Jim Rising to boom yeah. behind this and develop his land-based economy. Both Rising and Neely have decided not to go for the water at all. So just to give you a status quo, Bandra is gathering more resources. They've got one dock yeah. versus zero. So they're gathering more resources. Jim Rising will try to catch up with the town center behind this. Yeah, very clever. And uh, I was going to say they forced three outposts as a response, but they've actually realized that the threat was a mirage and canceled two of the outposts that they were building as well. So um, not an overreaction on their parts uh, in this instance. So that's kind of be good for them. And we actually see the mm. Silver Tree landmark being built by Neely. This is the landmark that functions as a market. And if you put it on your Uvu, you can double produce uh, using stone. You can double produce um, traders. So it looks like he might be going for a trade boom. Again, this is a 2v2. So you can kind of depend on your, your ally to provide enough of a buffer that you can get away with being greedy, whether it be with the docks or whether it be with traders. And if he can get a good trade route going with the Mongols, again, they have plenty of bonuses to trading that are going to mean that they can get a lot of economy in the late game with those traders if they can keep their side of the map secure. Exactly, and uh, just to kind of put things in perspective, there's many sources of gold. Traders um, are not just an infinite renewable source of gold, but they're also one of the higher sources of gold. And mm -hmm. because traders are made from that silver tree, not only are they cheaper, they're made from the ovu, you can double produce for the price of one, but they're also an additional source of income ramping. Just mm -hmm. like a second town center, just like a dock, the silver tree functions right. as a new source of income generation, so you'll go up exponentially. And this is how Neely and Jim Rising have apparently strategized to get back into the game after seeding water control. You see that trade route, that wow. blue line on the minimap. A really decent distance. Yeah. And come to think of it, because it's a two on two map, more potential distance is possible to be made because the map is simply True. bigger, Moltrap. The maps, there is an effect with the trading where the, the amount her distance is lower the larger the map, but it's still going to be more with, with larger maps right. in general. So, yeah, he's going to be able to get a lot of trading out there. And if it gets into the later game, there's an upgrade that you can do with the Mongols that they actually get stone returns in addition to gold with so their good. traders. So if you can get up to uh, nine or more traders and get a lot of... And actually, um, yeah, so he's going to be able to get a lot of... He's going to be able to get a lot of gold income and potentially stone in the late game. And right now... Um, the Bonjois team doesn't really have a lot to to stop that. He's going to be able to get away with a lot of traders right now. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, you know, two-on-two, -two, a lot of people feel like there's more space uh, in a two-on-two. -two. Uh, a lot of my viewers of regular streams will say, you know, I love AoE and I love watching one-on-one, -on -one, but I prefer playing two-on-two -two because it just feels mm. like I've got a bit more space. I still don't know if that's because two on two players are preferentially more defensive and passive or if it is because that is truly the better way to do it in right. this game because it's just harder to attack against potential two defenders that remains to be seen both by the way have traders already so that question remains unanswered as of yet but let's talk about the result that has been achieved so far by the team of uh of, of Jim Rising and Neely, because they made the first executive decision. They definitely didn't give full space. They created a distraction to build up their trader boom with those outposts, which, by the way, still alive, really annoying. They cannot send villagers to one another. 
and we can now see that the 11 well the 9.30 mark is when the Castle Age started for our Roost player. Again, two minutes slower than it potentially could be. So that is a nice delay on Horse Archers that has allowed Town Centers to come up for Jim Rising. And not for, yeah, I suppose not for Neely. Uh, so for Jim Rising. And we do see that Neely has started producing some Archer ships. Now, while Delhi can have their initial fishing ships shoot arrows, they're still not as strong as actual combat ships. And so a few combat ships come in here to harass the fishing fleet is going to force a disruption on that economy for honor. And uh, while he actually takes one of the sacred sites in the meantime, by the way, uh, Delhi, of course, has the ability to get an upgrade. It allows him to take sacred site at age two instead of age three. So that's a nice little boon to his economy that he's going to be able to get, again, probably over the long term. Because, yeah, as you said, I, who knows if it's better or not, but it seems to be the case that a lot of times 2v2 matches or higher team games end up being more long game economic games um so that that sacred site is going to pay off a lot of money over the long term yeah exactly and we may even see an eventual wonder victory if players are too entrenched yeah. for the other team to feel like it is feasible to quite attack into them i still think the future of professional two on two of, of high level competitive two on two should be a more targeted timed attack if anything we learned from so. starcraft 2 is that five fingers to a punch uh, is is a stronger uh, potential attack. It's a more overwhelming surprise to be attacked by two prepared, finely tuned players, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, you're right. StarCraft, in StarCraft 1 even, uh, 2v2 used to be part of the normal team leagues in Korea. And so I've seen a lot of those games and it was extremely rare for anyone to expand in those games because <laughs> if you are expanding and your two opponents attack your one ally that's not expanding, they lose. It's two versus one. And so it's usually not the best thing to do. Now, things are a little more def defensive in Age of Empires. You've got your town centers that are able to defend and what have you. So that might change things a bit. But anyway, we do have the Castle Age being reached by everyone except for Neely at this point. His is probably on the way. We do have a little bit of defense going up at those river crossings. Red Panda breaking through those defenses and venturing out into the enemy side of the map to potentially do some harassment. Potentially pick up some deer carcasses, because I think Red Panda did actually get the upgrade for the professional scouts. I thought I saw him carrying some deer earlier. Is that correct? Yeah, probably. Uh, I do believe he has done that. He would want to do that. He's headed straight for that uh, deer camp. Uh, we'll see kind of how that goes. We can also see the... Yeah, he's picking up the carcasses. We, we can see the initial formation of walls for Jim Rising. He's got a wall to the south side, definitely not covering the entire area of the map just yet. But uh, Jim Rising, the blue player, has some walls to the south of his base to kind of help protect there. In the meantime, here's a wall as well. Uh, yeah, quite a few walls, actually. And like you said, he's carrying the burden of wall protection mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the Mongol player, Nili, can't do. Ironically, he didn't build a gate, so the traders are actually having to go oh, no. around the wall and not able to go through the gate just yet. Oh no! I think I saw at least one of those. There was a gate that hadn't been built yet. Um, yeah. Do you did uh, have you noted? Did Jim Rising actually go for a second town center? We talked earlier about how Abbasids like to go for that, get the food stuff. But I I don't yep. know if I can see on the mini map. Did he get the second town center after all? Yeah, I, I do believe he did. Um, okay. We can actually uh, maybe do a quick run by to see everyone's economy. I kind of see where they are uh, with that. Traders are now getting attacked. Remember, they took the long way around because of the badly built wall. So they're going past the water. They should have never been here. Oh, it's no. become more obvious that yellow and blue traders are here. The, ma the wall just finished though, the gate, and therefore it is now possible to uh, see what's up with that. Current resources, we can see that Jim Rising is banking loads of food. Every player has made it to Castle Age, nearly by far the richest in terms of gold. Must yeah. be that step readout. Yeah, for sure. It's really interesting to see that, you know, as you kind of made uh, mention of earlier, there's a lot of different ways to get advantages in this game, economically or militarily. And so they seeded the fish. They seeded the fish, which, you know, the, the river is a really good way to get an early economic advantage. But then they went with the foodstuffs upgrade for the extra villagers. They went with the trading to get... So, and, and we're seeing... The demo professional ships. scouts. Oh, demo ship landing. Nicely done. Doing a ton of damage. And see, oh, I didn't even realize that. It's hard to tell which ships are which. But I didn't realize that. He actually completely obliterates Neely's navy and protecting his fishing ships as well. Very, very nicely done there. 
Um, wow. Uh, it, they've, there's kind of been like some mild conflicts going on. We've been seeing parts of, you know, towers being built by the river. Both players trying to use their ground armies to take control of the water as well. But I don't feel like um, uh, Bonjois' control of the water has really been fully disrupted at any point. Yep, that's quite true. They've got that control. And so the way that the Sif that doesn't end up contesting water usually plays this, you build a ninja dock, and then you end up flooding <laughs> explosions to your uh, opponent, uh, demo ships, uh, in fact. And we see a yellow demo ship coming here against six battleship. If he oh, goes, no. gets a good connection, he could maybe kill four of them. No, the arrow Ooh. ships turn around on time. Two demo ships may have been able to close the gap, but not quite. And we can see that the sacred site timer has begun. Anna and Red Panda are controlling both sides. One red, one green, but it's the two of them together that get that win condition ticking. Nine minutes left for the alternative win condition, Moltrap. As we, uh, as I think I caught you at drinking some water, very important, <laughs> sorry, awkward pastime. As uh, we have Camel Archers once again coming out here for Jim Rising. He seems to love that unit, the extra mobility that is offered by them. Yeah, and we do have, again, another skirmish going on down by this water source here. Uh, Camel Archers back in play. They're going to do not too much damage against these men-at-arms, but they can also just attack and retreat and attack and retreat and do damage over time, so they have that ability to be effective. It's really interesting that we, like I said, we have the, the Bonjoa team kind of having control of the water, and we're seeing Jim Rising and Neely be trying to be mm. defensive at points, but with these... These Palisade Walls in Strange Lakes. Oh no, look at these traders just going down one oh. after another to a set of archers, just picking them off. And and traders are big investment. Um, it's like this explosive junk though, coming down here on top of these ships. And it looks like there's Turn not enough to kill in time. It's gonna get there. Wait, he's not going for that. Oh. Is he going for the docks instead? Is he going for the men? He might be trying to kill units crossing the bridge instead. He might, not just, he might just not be looking at it. He just might <laughs> not be looking option. at it. It's probably what's going on. So it is going to go down and explode and uh, not do any damage there. It's a very exciting concept, but uh, there's, there's a tons demo of, stuff going of on what with not to do with that. <laughs> a demo of it? Yeah. <laughs> there's a demo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We've got elephants, but they are being forced away by these camel archers. And um, yeah, elephants, by the way, do count as cavalry, if I'm correct, right? So the, the mm -hmm. bonuses that the camel archers get are going to be against the elephants as well. You are making perfect sense. But, actually, Kama Archers do not debuff cavalry, they debuff oh. ho horses. Uh, so oh, ho okay. Yeah, horses have that uh, kind of... Um, it's actually true in the real world, too. Horses think camels look a bit weird. Uh, <laughs> and so they, they get afraid. It was actually used by ancient peoples as well, this, this advantage. Great strategy, well played. But uh, elephants, turns out, they are not afraid of camels. Interesting. Those archers have not been taken away, by the way. They're still chilling by that market. They've killed every single trader. They've completely reduced to ashes the uh, the boom of trading that they try to build up with the tra uh, on that side. So that is a pretty bad. Nicely done though by um, our green player, who I've forgotten which color is which right now. But putting those archers over there, it's an, uh, there's so much going on on this map. It's a two v two. There's multiple points of aggression across the middle of the map, and there's just so much stuff going on around the map. That's why we see people freaking about demo ships because there's skirmishes going on everywhere. And um, really interesting stuff going on. And by the way, we do have both the sacred sites ticking down now. Even though one of the sacred sites is on the opponent's side of the map, they, uh, they've been both taken by the Bonjois team. It's down now uh, just under six minutes. And uh, well done, Wisdom. Going for this cool overlay we have with the sacred sites so we can keep track of that. There's just nothing for that in game. Um, while Jim Rising pushing across the side of the map, though, they might be actually trying to go in here to take control of this area so they can neutralize that site before it gets too deep. Yeah, interestingly, they've gone across the map and they've denied the green keep, which is uh, Red Panda as Roos, but they haven't taken the site just yet. There are a few arrow ships there. I wonder whether he sent a unit there and got it killed. So that wind condition is still ticking. Five minutes and 20 seconds. Kind of an oversight here for Jim Rising and for Neely. I also see a large red force in Neely's base. This is a concern as well. Kama archers are gonna go on a raid <clears throat> as the attack is going on in Neely's main base right now. Uh, traders are here kind of getting attacked. We've got elephants inside the town center. Oh my gosh. Elephants <laughs> remain. These are tower elephants, so they are gonna be 
uh, ranged and melee at the same time. Elephants, they have those archers on top doing ranged damage, but the elephants actually do significant damage to buildings. They have basically a siege attack, so they can kill buildings very quickly if they want to, but it looks like they're just content to go over here and soak up damage with their large hit point pool and do more damage to these traders. Just so many traders going back and forth here. Yeah, um, it's I, they, I thought they killed a bunch earlier, but there's still a lot of them left. There's, there's always more coming out, and you know, I could just imagine the communication between Ander and Red Panda, where they're like, uh, hey, they got a lot of traders. Okay, what do you want me to do about it? Could you send like a couple of elephants or something? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'll send three. Give me a minute. <laughs> just send a squad of elephants up there to disrupt the trading. Uh, and it's it's being very effective because the hip the, the hit point count is very high on the elephants, so it takes a long time to deal with them, even if you have the the, mat the material to do that. So um, they are going to keep trading though. Looks like they've finally broken through on that side of the map, and the secret sites. Um, I'm not sure what's I going think on with them actually. Reset. Uh, have they been reset? No, no, no. We're not showing it right now because uh, it was actually kind of blocked together with the military overview. Uh, we'll show it from time to time. It looks like both are still in control of the Bonjwa team uh, as of yet. Yeah. We also, about a minute ago, we had a villager overview. It was about 80 to 70 villagers for all of the players. Uh, mm. Honor, a little bit lower on the villager count. But of course, he's got the, some of those relics. He's got the sacred side gold as well. Jim Rising was the highest. He was about 10 villagers ahead of everyone else, mm. courtesy of that second town center. But the big question is, besides inching out control of the map, inching out water of the map, are they going to stop this sacred site at all? It is still in control of Banjwa. There should be about four minutes left. And it, it seems like and they may be saying, okay, well, one of the sites is on our side of the map. We kind of have control of it. We can deal with that at a better point in time when it's convenient. And there we go. Finally, a couple of camel archers stepping on that site to take control of it. And it looks like, yeah, with just three minutes left, I don't think, um, I don't know if uh, Bonjwa team can get over there in time to stop this neutralization. We do have some forces coming in here to try and break down that wall. But I think that Palisade might be enough to stop them long enough that it looks like the sacred site is going to get neutralized. And I think this might have been what they were saying is like, look, all we have to do is send a couple units on there. It's our side of the map. I don't think we're going to be too worried about it. They, they finally had to deal with it. Uh, and oh. it is going to get neutralized there with two minutes left, just over two minutes left on that, uh, that victory condition. So very, very interesting situation. And uh, I, like, I like the harassment on this map with the camel archers running around the back, the elephants running in the back as well. Uh, things have been going on around this map so often. It looks like we do have Jim Rising trying to take control of this area with a keep. The keep is going to get up with that mass production of several villagers, and that's going to prevent a nice defense because he was losing the battle here against this invading Red Panda army. Where's Neely's army? Uh, is this a double one-on-one? -on -one? Is Neely still fighting off uh, Honor's army somewhere on the left side of the map? We've seen very few units from him in general, not just this game, but regressively in the one-on-one -on -one as well. Do love what Jim Rising is doing here. His mobile attack force. Oh, he only has 10 military supply, Neely, with 61 economy, 24 idols. Neely is in shambles. He's getting oh, rammed. Wow. He's getting men at arms. Oh, there's still men so at arms in the in the back line of his economy. Oh, that is that is really unfortunate. I will point out that in in team matches, you can transfer resources to your allies. Right. So it's possible that he says, you know what, you have the better production, I'm going to give you this money I'm producing with these traders, and you can produce the units and control them. They might have a bit of an alliance that way, but as you can see, he just doesn't have a lot to deal with this. There's even a ram on his town center over here, and he's just not doesn't have anything to basically deal with this situation right now. We have a Khan doing peck damage at an elephant. Imagine the leader of the Mongol civilization sitting there and single-handedly taking on two elephants. He's yeah, got spring alls now. That's right. <laughs> it just makes them angry, really. I don't think that's doing anything at all. They're getting bloodlust. They're now taking down Springolds. I love that Jim Rising put up a keep at this area. This is the single most important place on the map to defend. Not only is it a key to the second win condition of the map, the sacred site, but it also protects the future generations of income. The marketplace there, the traders that are going there, Jim Rising is doing what needs to be done. We can also see the military count, Honor, as Delhi with his elephants, has been doing an absolutely amazing job. Bon mm. Honor is carrying the kill count here for Red Panda and Honor uh, Banjwa wow. team, whereas Jim Rising is putting in so much work, seeking great cost efficiency in terms of the kill versus loss count. 
Jim Rising also has a huge gold bank, which he's now actually using to buy some food, as we could see. And one of the players has reached Imperial Age, Red Panda, the Rus, who can now get, potentially, long-range Springles, Bombards, he could go for elite horse archers, elite men at arms, even as Honor still on his H3 is pushing it with men at arms and rams. Yeah, he's already destroyed one of Dili's landmarks. He's going to go after this town center, which is his second one. And if you lose three of your landmarks, all, he's only on Castle Age, so he only has three of them, you instantly are eliminated, and all of your forces become idle. Or I actually think villagers sometimes keep mining, but you don't you generate income for your uh, ally or anything like that. And so he's actually in danger of just being eliminated here very very soon. He's kind of disp dispersing his buildings. They can pick up and, and fly away. And this reminds me of many a game where I had a burning engineering bay floating in the corner in StarCraft <laughs> 1, just trying to stay alive so that my allies could retaliate. Um, and uh, it looks like Jim Rising is retaliating. He is going to try and pick off some of those units, um, which are now running across the map. So he's going to save Neely from elimination at the moment. But this is not a good situation or their team to be in. You know what, Ball Trap? What I just considered, as you do indeed mention that relocation. Oh, double town center, by the way. He's trying to get back into the villager count. You know what he could have done at the start? He could have just literally moved his town center to the side of the map of Jim mm -hmm. Rising, and they could have had one two-headed <laughs> Hydra base, basically. True. Uh, having only a single point of defense could have been cool. I'm not sure it's good, but it would have been funny. I've also heard of people um, moving their town center to the river to plant it next to the docks when oh. the deli is producing the docks and slow down their docks that way. Um, That's funny. And now we I do see, as that. you mentioned, Red Panda has bombards out. So that keep that Jim Rising put over next to that site is gonna go down very quickly to the bombard fire pretty soon. Well, Things are yeah. kind of starting to slide away from the uh, Jim Rising Neely team at this point. He's, he's mass repairing over here to keep that keep alive, but it's only a matter of time until it goes down, I feel. Yeah, it's costing him about 20 wood per second to repair with that many mm. villagers. Uh, unlike some Blizzard RTS games, uh, repair costs are not a fraction of the total cost and build time. They only cost wood. And we can see Jim Rising's wood rapidly dropping against the Bombard fire. And against one Bombard, that's simply expensive. Against three Bombards, it's undoable. Bombards do 200 damage against a single target with more than that, more than 100% extra into buildings. I think like 240 extra or something. But it looks like with the Springles, with the Men at Arms, there is an attack. Neely has not gotten out of this yet. He's coming in with the Springold force to force back those Bombards. It looks like they saw it coming. The Bombards have fallen back from that keep. Um, but that many Springolds is, is, is going to be able to take out three Bombards that aren't defended pretty quickly. So it's a nice little uh, adaptation here by Neely getting that going. Uh, he's still on only on age three, so right now Red Panda the only one that can produce those bombards. And uh, are we going to see Jim Rising push across the river again? He seems to like doing these uh, demo ships. And demo oh! ships! Oh, those are! I didn't realize they're coming in on the heat. Realizes he falls back. Are they going to demo on the ground units? They do get away just in time. They blow up, but not within the main oh. area. The main explosion does not hit the ground units. That's one of the I. Should, I was thinking about that earlier. You can actually hit ground in. Oh, he goes for it again. <laughs> Jim Rising baiting those demo ships out is going to survive with most of his troops. But the demo ships cut his force in half. He had to fall That's back in two one. different directions. So some of his archers went across the river into enemy territory and have been slaughtered. The others have fallen back and now are regrouping. But he's, re he's re recrossing the river with a smaller force this time. Oh, man. that was, I didn't realize those were demo ships. Sometimes it's hard to tell with the It is the, hard the to ships, tell. But, um... That could have been epic. If you do not know, demo ships do damage in a radius, even if they're on a point, which is both accessible by ground and sea. So sometimes you see demo ships blow up 100 supply worth of infantry at the same moment. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the big story, like you said, is the splitting there. Part of the camel archers ran headfirst into archers, waiting to shoot them down in the crossfire of death. And it was a big set of losses for the Jim Rising Nili team. Yeah. He's now sending camel archers across the map, but you know, camel archers are not a game-ending unit. They can only harass. Men at arms, they can. They have torch damage. But the real game-ending units are bombards and trebuchets. Unless you see bombards and trebuchets, games tend to not end, even when there's large incursions of forces into enemy territory. Men at arms can do it, or knights, as they have decent torch damage, 
and they're resilient to enemy fire of times. <laughs> <laughs> you did not need to blow them all up. Wow. Blew up the fishing ships and the dock at the same time. And, and uh, that was amazing. That was amazing. <laughs> And something interesting about this force is Jim Rising's force. This is not just harassment of camel archers. This is their whole army. Yeah. And this is, I think, a good tactic. I don't know if it's going to work, but I think it's a good tactic when you're behind to put pressure back on your opponents to keep them from finishing off to try and buy time to switch things up. And that's what they're doing here. They're trying to invade the enemy territory with what they have. And oh no, the spring alts, which are going to save them from the other... Siege damage are getting set upon by men at arms. They're getting picked off so quickly. And it looks like this invasion has been met with not just an equal, but a greater force of defense. The spring alts are going to go down. The archers are dead. The infantry is dead. The camel archers are retreating. And it was a good attempt, I think. I think it was a bold, a bold strategy, which was what they needed. But it's been forced back. And um, yeah, I think Jim Rising and Neely, are, are, this game is slipping away from them. Yeah, I do think you are quite right. Uh, as uh, you know, just camel archers. We need higher quality units here, basically. As <laughs> yeah. we're clutching at straws here, you need bombers. Uh, just kind of looking at the army that has been arraigned uh, by honor, Red Panda. You would need crossbows for the men at arms. You would need probably bombers for the elephants. You need mangonels mm. for the archer ball behind it and springholds to defend your mangonels from enemy bombards and springholds. So uh, probably five different units at least are required and then some tanks for Neely and Jim Rising. But they're using camel archers, traders, villagers and springholds. It's not complex enough of an army and this might be the sledgehammer blow here mole trap to decide this first match of the day remember losing team shares 1250 dollars 625 mm -hmm. each for their participation time and efforts the winning team upgrades to 12 and a half well 12 and a half hundred dollars uh, each. each with yeah. the potential to fight in the finals for double that and here we go. They are moving in. This may be the killing blow here. If they get past this keep, which they will in a moment, they're going to be able to go in there and start killing off the infrastructure of Dim Rising. And once you lose your production and your economy, there's no coming back at all. The keep is going to go down momentarily. There's a desperate fight over here on the side. But again, like you said, they're not complex units. There's no siege units on the side of Dim Rising. It's just camel archers and a handful of men at arms facing Alex against crossbowmen and hand cannoneers annihilating them, just mowing them down. The Bombards and Springholds in the back doing significant damage to the buildings as well. The first uh, production building has fallen and it's just gonna be the Domino that's gonna be continuing through their side of the base. And look at this, we have some Springholds coming in from Neely from the top to try and um, kill off those enemy siege units. They're actually getting stuck there uh, <laughs> in the gateway and forced to fall back under the just absolutely massive amounts of infantry pushing in here. The Christmas infantry, red and green cannoneers and crossbowmen and archers clumped up together is just going to be too much even for spring alts to deal with. And they're going to be forced yeah. to fall back. And that means that the production buildings and the economy are now not just being harassed, but are under complete threat of annihilation. Yeah, I, I, I knew that Springholds were a gateway unit to safeguard the other <laughs> siege units, but I didn't expect Neely to take it quite so seriously to get stuck there and then fall behind the gate. I feel like we've almost never seen any units from him. It might be a bias from the observer perspective or a testament to the extreme disruption Honor perpetrated against him, but he's had those five Springholds, and what else? Perhaps all units that have died trying to defend the homeland in uh, semi vain yeah, and he was focusing very heavily on outputting traders, kind of depending on Jim Rising's pressure to be able to get him to get his economy boomed up. And, you know, Bonjoa team just dealt with that really, really well and counter-harassed, killed off those traders so they were never able to get to a critical mass where Neely's economy was so huge that he could output a bunch of units. And as a yeah. result, he didn't really output um, enough units to really to match uh, the opponents there. And now we're having to push in Bombards shelling down the town center. Soon it's going to be going after even more landmarks. And uh, with that much infantry in front, there's just... I mean, it's only three Bombards. But with so much infantry in front of them, there's just not going to be able to deal with it. And Jim Rising uh. surrenders. And I believe it's going to be GG. Bonjour team. Red Panda and Honor have taken 
the third game for the victory of the series and they will be advancing to the finals extremely extremely well played by them in all three games very well done very deservedly so yeah fantastic games by them we can see uh, just village account you know it isn't everything jim rising took the early lead nearly a little bit lower but he had loads of traders it's looking fairly even actually here but it was finally red pan that it started to really climb at that village account more importantly it's the military count we see honor just fielding a massive army early perhaps because he had that early fish boom he had so much food to mass produce the most wicked unit in the game the elephants Neely, mm -hmm. hard to climb over the 20 unit count for the military. Sadly for him, it's going to be a tough uh, debut here for him competitively in AoE4. Trust will see more from him as well, as well as Jim Rising. Red Panda and Honor will be taking this one. For sure. And, you know, to be uh, to be fair as well, um, you know, Neely uh, has, I don't think, been able to switch over to playing Age of Empires 4 full time. Whereas, you know, the Bonjois team have probably been spending a lot more time on that uh in the last you know month and a half since the game has come out um he's still been playing age of empires 2 and casting it and what have you so he's been a little bit busy to develop his skills but i think you're right i think it's not the last we're going to see of him we're going to have him uh you know if he potentially switches over more long term to age of empires 4 he's a guy with enough experience um that he's going to be a force to contend with later on exactly i think uh, we will see that uh from him as well uh, still a great performance by the two of them, but it's Red Panda and Honor that will be taking their Rus and Delhi into the finals, which will be later today. But before that, we're going to have the second semi-final match. And it's going to be, be between Hazuops and Trump against Petit Drogo and Pig. Yes, indeed. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to be getting to an interview, actually, with our winners here in uh, just a moment. We're going to be able to talk to... Honor and Red Panda, and uh, excited to kind of hear what their thoughts were on that situation, especially with the 2v2 match, which is, uh, as we've mentioned before, competitive 2v2 is a, a kind of a rarity so far in Age of Empires 4, and so um, I'm, I'm I'm wondering like what that felt like from their point of view in a competitive match as well. Exactly. Were they just winging it, or did they come with a prepared strategy? Uh, did they have a prepared strategy for all three maps? But we're going to be able to ask the two lovely gentlemen from Team Banjo at the German Streaming Collective ourselves. Yo, guys, welcome to the broadcast. Congrats on your first victory. Well done. And we can't hear you yet here. I hope stream can hear you. All right. It looks like we're working on some technicalities here. This is our first interview of the day. So we're going to get the bugs worked out here in just a moment. And we're going to be able to hear Hello, can you hear us? Guys, a moment. There yes. we go. Oh, now? nice. Ah, now it's working. Nice. Hello. Hi. Yo, con congrats, guys. How do you feel? Pretty pumped. A, bit, a little bit disappointed about my first match. <laughs> a lot of went wrong. <laughs> but uh, I got a carry in my team. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, kind of I'm, I'm kind of clouded because I got my next uh, vaccination today. So it's, oh. um, it's kicking in. I'm yeah. just like uh, a little bit boosted right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it works out, I guess. It works out. Yeah. yeah. Very nice games. Um, especially the 2v2 was very fun to play. Because yeah. no one of us, I think, plays uh, any competitive 2v2. So uh, we really had a blast there. It was a lot of freestyling. Yeah, tell, tell, <laughs> tell us more about that. Did you plan a specific strategy for the 2v2? Or were you mostly focused on your 1v1 prep for the most of the week? Uh, yeah, we, we, we were really, uh, we were really um, focused on the 1v1s first. Uh, 2v2, we, we hadn't really a strategy. So, um, yeah, it was good for us that Mongolian Heights was a map, I think. Uh, we were, uh, that, that was pretty good. So, the Delhi, um, we were able to play them on the strength. And mm. um, overall, we were just scared of a big push uh, because Mongolians and Abbasid like we we just thought okay don't die to any archer <laughs> tower rush and ram push and yeah as soon as we did this it went pretty well i guess so you had no prepared strategies for the two on two uh, what mm. about the one on one uh, this tournament format has uh, a map pool of seven you're going to be able to know roughly which maps you want to ban 
And I would imagine that to be a prepared strategy. But tuning in 30 minutes before the show began, I still heard you guys agonizing about different map picks and Red Panda <laughs> with Delhi not wanting to play a good map for the Delhi. <laughs> yeah. It, it was like uh, after the bands, uh, um, I, I think we started on Wednesday with the bands, picks and bands. Um, mm. uh, and we got the the second and the seventh bands, uh, picks, not bands. And yeah, after it, um, we w we talked about the picks and we thought like, hmm, why didn't we pick the episode? Because no one of us can play right. Delhi. <laughs> 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 we just heard Delhi are pretty good, so yeah. yeah and yeah. then for we those started of you just training. Tuning in at home, for anyone tuning in, we're talking about the picks and bands for the civilizations. They got second pick of Civ and seventh pick of the civilizations. So they were able to pick yeah, Roost early, I, and then they had a choice between Abbasids and and Delhi at the end there. Yeah, I kind of trained Delhi a bit, but I only really trained it on the Gary, and it's not in the map pool. <laughs> So I'm, I was kind of <laughs> freestyling and I had a lot of uh, a lot of strats in mind. I wanted to ramp push, then I cancelled the ramp push when I saw there were two st uh, stables. Yeah, a lot of mm, lot uh, of things went wrong, but Honor was able to to get it get us to the two v two, and I think in the two v two, especially in the Mongolian Heights, we are pretty pretty good. We can control the water pretty much, and the only thing we were scared of was the tower rush, and we were able to defend it pretty pretty easily. And after we dealt with the, the trade boom, we were pretty good in the game, I think. Yeah, the traders were insane. When we saw <laughs> them, we were like, whoa, what's so going many. on? <laughs> did, there was a lot of them. <laughs> did Neely build any army and it's except traders, or was it only traders for like 30 minutes? Traders. I think it was traders and five springles. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if he sent res resources to his ally. We're not getting call outs on oh. the observer UI. I think Honor, uh, you know, did a lot of disruption. The elephants, uh, the minute arms run by, so he was kind of dysregulated. Sometimes some idle villagers. Uh, you pressured him a lot, and courtesy of that fish boom from Honor as well, and it's good management as well, of course. Yeah. Well, we're gonna yeah. be moving on Thanks. before too long to our second match, gentlemen. Do you have anything else you'd like to uh, say or comment on, or any best moments you want to talk about before we move to our second game? Yeah, thanks for having us. It's really, uh, we're, we're really having a blast. Really fun tournament. And uh, yeah, we're looking, really, really looking forward to the next match and to the finals after that. Hope we play well, against him. We'll, we'll see you in the finals yeah. in a little bit. Sorry, uh, who do you hope for in the grand finals? Oh, the Hazu, the Hazu Trump team, or are you hoping for Petit Of course, of course yeah. We want Hazu. <laughs> <laughs> German Derby. Yes. You guys have played Hazu in other games before, I think, right? Yeah, uh, some won me once, and I lost all of them. I don't know why, <laughs> but I lost all of them when wow. he was new to the game. So I really want my revenge now. Like we played three right. games, China was HRE, and I lost all three. All right, we got Even though you're higher rank on the ladder, interesting. Well, yeah. that's maybe a vision of what's to come as Honor will try to work out what went wrong there. We're going to get things set up for the second semifinals as our Banjo team will no doubt be looking and studying the competition. Of course. Thanks, guys. We'll see right, you thanks. soon. We'll see you in a little bit.